Hi everyone, Christy here from Master One Thing. Today we have the honor to have Dr. Matt Cablen from the University of Washington as our guest in the podcast. Matt is one of the world's leading researchers in the rapamycin field and has done rapamycin research for two decades on multiple species. Everything from yeast, worms, mice, uh, uh, and also dogs and humans. So Matt uh, has done a big uh, contribution to the longevity field uh, thanks to this. And it's a big honor to have him on the show. So Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. A good place uh, to start this uh, interview is to go uh, back in time uh, to the beginning of uh, 2000. What did your research team discover during that time regarding rapamycin? Sure. So, so it really wasn't until a few years later that um, that I really started thinking about mTOR, which is the protein that, that rapamycin inhibits. mTOR, of course, stands for mechanistic target of rapamycin, and rapamycin is an inhibitor of mTOR. Um, and the reason why we got interested in mTOR as a potential longevity regulator really came from a, a genetic screen that Brian Kennedy and I were doing at the time. This was in yeast, which is a single cell model organism, one of the, the kind of four major laboratory model organisms used in aging research, at least at that time. And we were really doing what's called an unbiased genetic screen, meaning we didn't go into the study with any preconceived notions about, you know, which genes or pathways were going to be important. We really wanted to let the biology tell us what was important about aging. And so, you know, our approach was to just start looking at, at individual mutants where one gene had been deleted and simply ask the question, when do we see lifespan extension in these mutants? And we were fortunate at the time that, that other people had created a collection, a library of strains called the Yeast Genome Deletion Collection, where we could go through and basically just pick them out one at a time and measure their lifespan. So that was really what we were doing. And, um, you know, at that time, well, still, there are, I think, about uh, five, five or 6,000 individual gene deletions that are viable, meaning that's the number that we could test for lifespan. Because if it's an essential gene, the lifespan is by definition zero when you delete it. So um, so we had started screening through this library. And, and it's worth saying the yeast replicative lifespan assay is quite time consuming and tedious. It involves sitting in a microscope and manually using a, a little fiber optic needle dissecting daughter cells away from mother cells until those mother cells senesce. And on average, it's about 25 daughter cells per mother cell. So Brian and I spent a lot of time at the microscope dissecting daughter cells away from mother cells. Um, I think some people thought we were crazy, but we got lucky in the sense that the TOR1 deletion mutant was in the first 500 or so that we screened out of the five or 6,000. And, you know, when we looked through the list and we saw that deletion of TOR1 extended lifespan, you know, then we got really interested because there was already literature around mTOR. So the yeast version of mTOR is TOR1. Uh, there was already literature around mTOR being involved in nutrient sensing and growth. And so we immediately had the hypothesis that maybe the mTOR, the TOR1 deletion, which was long lived, was a mimic for caloric restriction. It kind of made sense given what was known about the role of TOR in nutrient response at, at that time. So this was like 2003, just setting the stage. Um, uh, and if, then of course, there's a drug called rapamycin that's an inhibitor of mTOR. So that's really how I got interested in rapamycin. It was through this unbiased genetic screen that we did. And so, you know, if you go back, we ended up publishing that first paper. I think it was 2005, maybe when the paper came out. And in that first set, TOR, deletion extended lifespan. We didn't have anything in that paper on rapamycin that was really focused on the genetic inhibition of TOR in this deletion mutant. The thing that I think was so sort of interesting and exciting about that time period was, you know, at the same time we were looking in yeast and we stumbled on TOR1, other labs were working in C. elegans and fruit flies completely independently. We had no, we had no idea that they were doing this work. And they also found that genetically knocking down TOR 
could increase lifespan in worms and in flies. So in this period of two years, we had multiple papers in three different model organisms, all sort of converging on this, this single gene, this pathway as being important for lifespan determination in organisms that are really, really quite genetically divergent. So the evolutionary distance between yeast and worms is about as far as the evolutionary distance from worms to humans, right? So the fact that you had the same pathway in yeast and worms and flies affecting lifespan was, was quite compelling. The actual first study showing that rapamycin, the drug, could extend lifespan was a follow-on that, that we did um, in collaboration with a, a scientist named Trey Powers, who was a graduate student at the time in, in my postdoc lab, which was Stan Fields' lab. Trey and I showed that you could treat yeast with rapamycin and extend what's called chronological lifespan. And again, I know I'm getting in the weeds a little bit, but I actually think this is an important point. So we had shown that the genetic TOR1 mutant could extend replicative lifespan. How many times can a yeast cell divide? What Trey showed was you could treat yeast with rapamycin or use the TOR deletion mutant and also extend chronological lifespan. <clears throat> chronological lifespan is the length of time that a non-dividing yeast cell can stay alive. And so we think these are actually models for different types of aging in a complicated animal like a human. In our bodies, we have dividing cells, non-dividing cells. We can model those two things independently in yeast. And we found that TOR was important for both, both types of aging. But it was really that 2006 study that, that Trey is the first author on um, that was the first demonstration that rapamycin, the drug, could extend lifespan in any organism. Very interesting. Does there exist uh, any humans uh, that has uh, uh, mTOR defect uh, or something like that? Uh... Yeah, so the, it's a good question. And I think uh, another way to frame it is, you know, we might predict that there, there are people out there with variations in mTOR or in other components of the mTOR pathway that have sort of constitutively reduced activity or constitutively higher activity, and they might have longer or shorter lifespans, right? I mean, that would be that would be one prediction if, if mTOR is, is regulating longevity in humans. So mTOR itself, um, there aren't a lot, as at least to the best of my knowledge, there aren't known strong mutations in human mTOR uh, that that are associated with really anything uh, significant because I think mTOR is so essential that any strong mutations, either direction, up or down, are likely to lead to inviability. So if you have too much mTOR activity, you're gonna, you're gonna be predisposed to cancer and all sorts of uh, hypertrophic conditions. So too much growth. And you probably are gonna die very early in life or in utero if you have strong mutations in mTOR that hyperactivate mTOR. The flip side is if you have strong mutations that reduce mTOR activity, you're also very likely to, to, to survive or you, it may lead to a viable birth, but those uh, children are going to be have stunted growth and probably be infertile or very low fertility. So there's a strong selective disadvantage to uh, significant variations in mTOR itself. That's my speculation, but I think there's pretty good reason to believe that's true. So what has been done is to look at other components of the pathway. So upstream regulators, for example, like TSC1 and TSC2. There is a disorder called tuberous sclerosis, where people have mutations in TSC1 and TSC2, which lead to hyperactivation of mTOR, and they're predisposed to different types of tumors. So that's again, what we would expect if you have hyperactivation of mTOR. They're also predisposed to, to dementia. It's a little bit, it's not Alzheimer's disease, it's a non-amyloid dementia, but uh, but hyperactivation of mTOR in humans is associated also with, with dementia. So that kind of makes sense with what we think we know about mTOR and rapamycin. And then there have been a few studies looking at genetic variants associated with extreme human longevity. And some of those studies have found an enrichment in components of the mTOR pathway. But one of the challenges with those kinds of studies is we don't know a priori whether those variants are activating, inactivating, whether they lead to you know, higher mTOR or lower mTOR. I think our hypothesis would be, in general, the variants that are associated with extreme longevity in humans are going to also be 
variants that reduce mTOR signaling, but we don't really have that information uh, just from the genetic association study. So yes, there's, 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 I think, substantial evidence that variation in mTOR signaling can be associated both with age-related diseases and with longevity, but it really is not to the point, I think, of a strong causal argument at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. do, do we know uh, if we look at the, the uh, Loran syndrome with the IGF-1 yeah. uh, defect, does, does that uh, impact uh, mTOR also? Do you know? Something um, it definitely will. So, so again, you know, I think it's uh, for people who maybe aren't in in the weeds of this biology. It's worth just saying at a very high level, right? mTOR is sort of a sort of a central node in this network that that couples environmental sensing, so nutrient sensing, and and other components of the environment that are important for determining growth rate with development and growth and reproduction, right? So mTOR is one of the key components of that network. Of course, also in that network are things like growth hormone, insulin-like growth factor one, metabolic regulation through AMP kinase and things like that. So, so these factors are all talking to each other. And it is absolutely the case that if you have constitutive down regulation of growth hormone IGF-1, which is what you see in the, the Lerone uh, individuals, that you're also going to have a, a on average, a down regulation of mTOR signaling. I think we have to be a little bit careful about assuming that that is going to be true in every tissue, in every part of the body. I think that probably hasn't been closely looked at. Certainly in the model organisms like C. elegans, we know that when you have mutations in the IGF-1-like pathway that affects mTOR signaling and also affects longevity. So yes, there are going to be connections there. The expectation is that again, on average, uh, people who have mutations in growth hormone signaling that reduce that signaling are going to also have constitutively lower mTOR activity, probably throughout their lives, certainly during development. Do do we know why rapamycin works uh, so well in uh, multiple uh, species? Yeah, um, so I think there there are many levels to try to answer that question. You know, if you want, if you're talking about a mechanistic level, like what what are the downstream mechanisms that allow rapamycin to increase lifespan? We we can get into that. It's complicated, as you can probably imagine. I mean, I think the simple answer is every every eukaryote, so we're going to exclude bacteria, right? Bacteria are not eukaryotes. Every eukaryote that I know of has mTOR. So mTOR is very, very highly conserved across eukaryotic organisms. And the structure of that complex, so again, we're going to get a little bit in the weeds, but it turns out that in, again, to the best of my knowledge, all eukaryotes have two mTOR complexes mTOR complex one or mTORC one and mTOR complex two, mTORC two. So the way rapamycin works is it is what's called an allosteric inhibitor of mTOR complex one, meaning that it actually binds a second protein, FKBP12 in people, FPR1 in yeast, binds that protein and that complex then goes and disrupts mTOR complex one, okay? So it's a specific biochemical inhibitor of mTOR complex one. The reason why I'm going into this is that, that both of those complexes are conserved throughout all eukaryotes, as is the structure of those complexes. So they haven't diverged much in structure, which means biochemically, rapamycin appears to work pretty similarly in all eukaryotes, okay? So so that's that's why that's one answer to the question of why do we see these effects of rapamycin across all of these organisms? Because biochemically, the ability of rapamycin to inhibit mTOR complex one is conserved across all of those organisms, and the biology of mTOR complex one and mTOR complex two is also highly conserved. Why is it highly conserved? Again, it's hard to state with a hundred percent confidence, but I think it's highly likely the reason why this is so strongly conserved is because of the fundamental role that mTOR plays in this key decision that every organism has to make. Sense the environment and decide whether to reproduce. And, and that decision, especially the deciding whether to reproduce is the core of natural selection, right? That's how evolution is acting. So, so, so mTOR is really a central regulator of that that decision point. And my guess is it's very challenging 
to, uh, to to change that from an evolutionary perspective because it's going as as I already alluded to strong mutations in that complex are are very often going to lead to inviability or a strong selection against. So I think that's why it's been so strongly conserved. Now, what are the mechanisms? So so first of all, we haven't said this yet, but it's worth stating explicitly. Rapamycin, the drug, has been shown to extend lifespan in every laboratory model where it's been tested, again, at least to the best of my knowledge, um, as has genetic inhibition of mTOR. So mutations in mTOR or other mutations in the pathway have been shown to extend lifespan in yeast and worms and flies and mice. Okay. So I think an interesting question there is, is the mechanism the same, right? By which inhibition of mTOR, whether it's genetically or pharmacologically with, with rapamycin, is the mechanism the same in all of those organisms? That I think is still an open question. We don't, we don't completely know the answer to that. Part of the reason why we don't know the answer to that is that because mTOR sits at the center, I, I keep saying this, it's at the center of this really, really important network, right? Because it sits at the center of this network, it's regulating a whole bunch of downstream processes. And by downstream processes, I mean things like protein synthesis, autophagy, mitochondrial function, inflammatory response, right? We can keep going down the list. There's all these effects that, rap, that, that mTOR is regulating. And then, you know, by extension, rapamycin is affecting that seem to be important for aging in these different model organisms. And it's been really challenging, I think, to point to one of those and say, that's why rapamycin is extending lifespan. Some people think autophagy is the key. Some people think the metabolic effects are the key. Some people think the anti-inflammatory effects are the key. My intuition is they're all important and the relative importance of those things may depend on this tissue that we're talking about, the biological state of the individual, right? How old an individual is. I think these things can vary in importance depending on the specific context, but it's probably all of them together that are really accounting for the fact, number one, that rapamycin can have pro-longevity benefits across all of these organisms. And number two, the benefits seem to be relatively large, at least compared to other interventions that, that people are studying currently. And the thing uh, uh, you talked a, li a little bit about, uh, which goes a little bit uh, hand in hand, is the hallmarks uh, of aging, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, does the, do you think uh, um, rapamycin uh, um, impacts all the hallmarks of aging, or is it uh, some certain uh, parts of uh, the hallmarks? So you can definitely find uh, evidence in the literature that rapamycin can impact all of the hallmarks of aging. Now, you know, the hallmarks of aging is sort of a moving target, and people now are saying there's 11 hallmarks, and say nine hallmarks, whatever. You can find evidence that rapamycin or mTOR uh, are, are affecting all of the hallmarks. I would say it seems pretty clear that rapamycin has larger effects on some of the hallmarks of aging. For example, mitochondrial dysfunction. We know rapamycin is potent at, at suppressing at least some types of mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, senescent cells. So rapid, we may get into this a little bit later. Rapamycin is not what's called a senolytic, meaning it doesn't kill senescent cells, but it is a very potent senomorphic, meaning that it shuts off a lot of the inflammatory signaling, the SASP that senescent cells give off. So, so, so you know, I think we could point to those two and say, yeah, rapamycin is super potent at targeting those hallmarks of aging. You could point to things like telomere shortening and say, well, the data there is not quite so clear. Is Does rapamycin directly impact telomere shortening? It's not so It's not so solid. So, so the answer is yes. I think it is affecting all of the hallmarks of aging. Um, but I think you can also make a case that it's affecting, differentially affecting those hallmarks to, to different extents. But I would also say, again, the hallmarks of aging are somewhat of an artificial construct, right? The hallmarks of aging are what, you know, the field or a subset of the field sort of settled on as the aspects of biological aging that's, that seem to be, at the time, particularly important. And that's why they're changing as we go, right? We've learned more in the last 10 years that has caused us to maybe think a little bit differently about the hallmarks. But it's important to recognize the hallmarks of aging, even though they're a really, really powerful construct and have done a lot of good, 
they're also artificial and they certainly don't represent every aspect of biological aging. So you could almost make a circular argument and say, well, rapamycin should affect the whole, let's, let's make the assumption that rapamycin is affecting biological aging. I certainly believe that. And I think that's a reasonable assumption. Let's make that assumption. If rapamycin is affecting biological aging, then it really should affect all the hallmarks of aging. And if it doesn't, maybe that's because the hallmarks of aging are the problem, not because rapamycin is the problem. So I just think it's really useful for people to recognize the hallmarks of aging are nothing more than our best guess 10 years ago as to what was important in the biology of aging. And it is not a complete picture of biological aging by any stretch of the imagination. It's, uh, it's like the, the map, but the, the map is not the reality. So the yeah, map absolutely. Yeah, that's right. It's an imperfect representation of reality. I think what's I think, but I think still, and I'm you know, it's useful to point to to, to point this out. There are going to be different opinions in the field about how close the hallmarks are to to reality, right? There are some people who are going to believe, yeah, you know, we've got a pretty good handle on aging, and this is a pretty good representation. And then there are going to be people. And I would kind of put myself in that camp who think there's probably more that we don't know about biological aging than we do. And the hallmarks are actually a pretty crappy representation of biological aging. They're the best that we've got, but they're not that good. That would be my personal guess, right? So it's just, it's useful. It's useful to say that because I think even the scientists in the field, we sometimes fall into the trap of thinking that the hallmarks are reality and they're not, they're just a model for what the biology of aging looks like. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, one, one thing, uh, there, and there has been uh, done quite uh, much, uh, mice uh, studies on, uh, on uh, rapamycin also. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that also? I could talk a lot about that. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think um, maybe the way, maybe I'll approach it from sort of a historical perspective first, and we can do a little bit deeper dive on, you know, anything that you you, you think is, uh, is, is worth going more deeply into. So, you know, I, I sort of set the stage. There were these papers, you know, 2003 to 2005, all showing that genetic inhibition of mTOR can increase lifespan in yeast and worms and flies. And then, and then Trey and I, did work showing that rapamycin could increase lifespan, at least in yeast. I think, you know, at that point, the field was kind of paying attention, but they weren't really paying attention because that, because, because at that point, I think there were still a lot of people who weren't completely sure how much of the biology of aging would be shared from yeast and worms and flies all the way up to, to humans. Um, and I think what really changed that picture was the study from the National Institute on Aging Interventions Testing Program, with the first one that I know of with rapamycin, um, that that was that that really I think captured people's attention was this study from the ITP, where they showed that you could treat mice with rapamycin and get I think it was a nine percent lifespan extension in males and a fourteen percent lifespan extension in females. We now know that's at the lower end of the dose response, but it was really the first time that that extension had been made from yeast and worms and flies up to mice. So people started paying attention then. There were a couple of other things about that study that I think also are really important to, 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 to dive into a little bit deeper because they, at least for me, kind of changed the way that I thought about the biology of aging and I think had that impact on the field as a whole. Um, you know, one was there was this very clear difference between males and females and that the females seemed to have a bigger lifespan effect from rapamycin. And again, this might be worth going into the weeds a little bit. The way the interventions testing program is designed is the experiments are done independently in both male and female mice at three different sites. Okay, so Jackson Labs, Michigan and San Antonio. So there's built-in triplicate replication, which means you can look at the average across all of the sites, or you can look at each individual site and uh, and see if the intervention had, an, had the same effect at each site. So one of the things that was interesting about, about this 2009 study, uh, David Harrison's the lead author on that, it's kind of a famous nature study, was that I think at all three sites, females showed a bigger lifespan effect than males did. So there was this was really the first example of what now I think is the norm, which is that there are differences in these interventions in males and females. So we now recognize that there are sex specific effects to longevity interventions. We don't understand the biology there, but pretty much every intervention that has been shown to extend lifespan in mice 
either works greater or lesser in one sex, or in many cases only works in one sex. So rapamycin is actually kind of unique in the sense that it actually extends lifespan in both males and females, but at any given dose, at least at the lower doses, the females respond better. So that was one important feature of that study, which has proven to be the norm rather than the exception. Um, but the other really important feature was that for reasons that are kind of funny to talk about in hindsight, they actually didn't start the treatment until 20 months of age. And that's about the mouse equivalent biologically, you know, roughly speaking of a 60 year old person. So this was really, I think, unexpected. I certainly didn't expect it. I think most people when they started that experiment thought it wasn't going to work, including the, the directors of the interventions testing program. Um, the reason why they didn't plan to do it that way, I don't know if you know this story, but they actually planned to start the intervention early in life at nine months of age, which is what they do for all of their interventions as a standard protocol. It turns out because rapamycin is unstable at gastric pH, they couldn't put it in the food and actually get bioavailability. And so they had to start all of the cohorts because they're testing multiple interventions at a time. They had to start all of the cohorts at the same time. And so they weren't able to work out the encapsulation protocol. And, and if anybody's heard of E-Rapa, that's the kind of rapamycin that's encapsulated rapamycin that's used in most mouse studies. They weren't able to work out that encapsulation protocol until the mice were 20 months of age. So that's why they started it at 20 months of age, because they had to do this exercise to be able to get the bioavailability of the drug in the small intestine. So it wasn't planned. It was a very fortuitous accident, I would say. So anyways, they started the treatment at 20 months of age. Nobody thought it was going to work. And, you know, lo and behold, they got this lifespan extension. It was the only intervention in that cohort that extended lifespan. And I, I really, looking back, think this was a paradigm shift in the field. Because prior to that, I don't know if people will admit it today, but I was around. I can tell you, prior to that, pretty much everybody in the field thought you had to start early in life to get any significant benefit. Even with caloric restriction, that was sort of the dogma that was out there. You had to start early in life or you wouldn't get the full effect or the effect would be tiny or you wouldn't get any effect. I think this result with rapamycin fundamentally changed that viewpoint because all of a sudden we had an intervention that hadn't been tested starting from a young age. At that point, it had only been tested from starting at 20 months that had this big effect on lifespan at all three sites across the ITP, rock solid, built-in triplicate replication, no question about it. I think that was really important. And in fact, that kind of set the stage for what I think most of us believe today, which is that aging is modifiable, biological aging is modifiable even in old age. And while I'm not one of those people who likes to talk about reversing aging, because that I think that implies something different, that implies taking an old animal or individual and making them young again, we can reverse aspects of aging. We can reverse functional declines that go along with aging even after those declines have started. And I think rapamycin is the poster child for that. We know now multiple tissues and organs where you can take an old mouse, serious functional declines in those tissues and actually see them get better. You can see them functionally get better. So I think this was the first indication of what now, you know, many of us have come to, to accept about the biology of aging. We didn't, we didn't know that before this study. So I think this was, you know, if I had to point to one study like the most important study in the field, that would be right up at the top of my list because I think it changed the way that we think about the biology of aging and, and interventions and when you have to start them. And I think this has set the stage for you know the, the whole translational push that we're seeing in the field now to try to move into the clinic. If we, if we had found instead that interventions like rapamycin only work starting in young animals, I think you'd see a lot more hesitation for people, companies, academic clinical trials to move into clinical trials, because it's really not realistic to think we're going to start treating people with these longevity interventions as teenagers. But now we know that the biology of aging in old animals and presumably old people is modifiable. That changes the game. So I think it's also been super important from that perspective. I'll just add one thing. I know I've gone on for a while. I tend to do that. Um, <laughs> I'll just add one more thing about this study, though. So I said that um, you know after this study came out, we didn't know what the effect of rapamycin would be for, from young age, right? The expectation, again, I think at that time was that if we started the treatment earlier in life, and now by we, I mean the, the, the field as a whole, the interventions testing program, if uh, treatment was started earlier in life, that, that the, it's likely that there would be a larger magnitude of effect on lifespan. So the interventions testing program has gone back and done this now multiple times 
Um, and it turns out there might be a little bit larger effect, but most of the benefit, again, at least in terms of lifespan, you can achieve most of the benefit with rapamycin starting at 20 months of age that you get if you start at nine months of age or six months of age. So it's really interesting. And I think that, again, is telling us something important about the, the biology of aging and the way rapamycin is impacting that biology of aging. Yeah, super interesting. And uh, a wonderful uh, ac accident in the <laughs> science field. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's funny how that happens in science sometimes, right? And, you know, who knows where we'd be if we hadn't had that that accident. So, yeah, very fortuitous. Yeah. And um, you you touch uh, a little bit on that, um, that um, uh, some, some people say that rapamycin only delays uh, aging, but uh, it can also reverse aging. Uh, tissues or organs uh, can you can you uh, elaborate a little bit uh, deeper on that sure so i think there's a couple things to say about this and i think honestly it all boils down to how you define aging right so and even biological aging i think there is no consensus in the field i think i think i think biological aging is a useful concept right and i think most of most of the experts in the field at least have a pretty common vision of what we mean when we talk about biological aging. And it encapsulates the hallmarks of aging and functional measures of aging and mortality risk. Um, but I think that, you know, when we get these apparent disagreements uh, over, you know, whether rapamycin is reversing aspects of aging, delaying aging, not delaying aging, um, you can find people out there that claim all of those things. Really, it comes down to how you how they're defining aging. And I think that's a bit of a problem because there is now um, a tendency in the field for people to, to feel like it's okay. And by people, I mean scientists in the literature or on social media, it, to, to feel like it's okay to co-opt that term and use it however they want to. And I think that's creating all sorts of problems for the field internally and externally. Um, but I think these disagreements really come down to definitions of aging. So you, you will find people, and I think this is, I'm, I, I honestly, I think it's silly. I don't understand how people can make this argument, but you will find people who will argue that rapamycin does not affect aging. And the core of that argument is that at least some of the measurements that we can make with rapamycin in terms of like cardiac function, uh, grip strength, things like that, where we see benefits in old mice, you can see benefits in young mice, right? So their argument is, well, if it's affecting young mice, it's not affecting aging. Okay, that, that's the core of that argument. They have chosen to, to define aging a specific way and they'll, they'll make that argument. Okay, what I think we can say about the data is that rapamycin clearly extends lifespan in mice. Pretty much every tissue and organ where it has been carefully looked at, if you look at mice that have been taking rapamycin and you look in old age, there are tissues and organs at, at, at a specific age, right? So you're comparing, let's just say, 28-month-old non-treated mice to 28-month-old treated mice. So if you look cross-sectionally at a specific age, the tissues and organs from rapamycin-treated mice have less pathology. They look molecularly younger than the mice that didn't get rapamycin. Okay, that's an observation. That data is clear. Lots and lots of papers showing this. So you could argue that from that, that rapamycin is delaying at least some aspects of biological aging, right? Molecularly, pathologically, rapamycin seems to be delaying aging in those tissues. That also fits with the, the fact that the mice are living longer, okay? So now the other observation that I think complicates this answer is at least in some tissues, we now know that if you take an old mouse where function has already declined, you start giving it rapamycin, say at 20 months, 22 months, 24 months, you start giving rapamycin then, and you actually see functional improvements. You see sometimes molecular improvements, okay? That looks like reversing aging. And functionally, it is reversing the changes that go along with aging. Um, and that's been seen clearly. Multiple labs have shown this in heart. Uh, there, there's one lab, this was a 2009 study from Pan Zheng's lab that I think definitively showed this in the immune system. And I'm happy to dive into the details here if you want what they actually showed, but definitively showed that you could rejuvenate immune function in aged mice with rapamycin. Again, these are all short-term treatments as well, anywhere from six to, to 12 weeks. 
Um, and then many other labs have shown, I think less convincingly, but in different detailed ways that you can reverse changes that go along with immune aging with rapamycin. Um, and then in my lab, we showed that you could reverse three different clinically defining features of periodontal disease in aged mice with rapamycin. So in that case, we looked at bone around the teeth. We could actually see regrowth of bone. So with age, you lose bone around your teeth. We could see that we were getting regrowth of bone around the teeth in the aged mice. We could see a knockdown of gingival inflammation, so inflamed gums. Again, there was, there's an age effect there, and we could reverse that. Most interestingly, I think we also saw that we could reverse, you know, at least at some level, uh, what are considered pathological changes in the oral microbiome with age. We could the, the composition of the oral microbiome went back to looking like something more like what you would see in a young animal. Really interesting biology there. I can speculate on the mechanism, but I don't know the mechanism. So in any case, you can reverse oral aging or at least some aspects of, of oral aging, both functionally and molecularly. Um, and then there's unpublished data uh, still, I've been waiting for this data to come out on ovarian aging. And, and so it's been presented at meetings, but it hasn't been published yet. Again, in mice that you can see functional rejuvenation of uh, aged ovaries in female mice with short-term treatments with rapamycin. So I think at least in those four places in the body, it's clear in normative aging that you can see functional reversal of age-related phenotypes. The other place that's really interesting is the brain. There hasn't been as much in the context of normative aging here. So, so we know that rapamycin can preserve cognitive function. So cognitive function declines in mice with age. We know rapamycin can preserve cognitive function. There hasn't been as much looking at a restoration of cognitive function in the context of normative aging, but in Alzheimer's disease mouse models where they have been engineered to develop dementia, there are cases where people have actually shown both molecular, so neuropathological reversal of age-related phenotypes and functional, so cognitive improvements in age-related phenotypes in the brain. So that's kind of a fifth one that's, that's kind of in its own separate category because that's not so much in the context of normative aging, but I think we all believe that dementia is important in normative aging. And the question really comes down to whether these mouse models are good models of human dementia or not. And that's a, that's a whole different question. And uh, one, um, one area that shaped a little bit uh, uh, the field was uh, when, uh, the, the studies on um, immune system. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that? Yeah, sure. So so I think um, most people who are not, you know, uh, aficionados of the longevity field or of rapamycin in the context of the longevity field, especially clinicians, if they've ever heard of rapamycin. So again, first thing it's worth saying, in the clinical world, rapamycin is typically called serolimus. Um, same molecule, I mean, it's exactly the same, different name. So clinicians probably, at least as of a couple of years ago, I think it's changing because rapamycin is starting to become more visible. At least as of a couple of years ago, most physicians probably don't know what rapamycin is. They might know what serolimus is. If they have dealt with organ transplant patients, they will definitely know what serolimus is. So clinically, you know, rapamycin was first approved under the name serolimus as an organ transplant rejection medication. And so most people outside of the, the longevity field up until you know we started really thinking hard about its possibility to affect the biology of aging in humans, most people would think of rapamycin as an immune suppressant. That's how you will hear it referred to. I'm guessing if you do a Google search, that's the first thing that will come up. So it, and, and, and it is, in a sense, it is an immunosuppressant at high doses, it certainly is effective at uh, reducing the risk of organ transplant rejection in organ transplant patients. Um, I think it's more fair to say, though, overall, rapamycin is an immune modulator. So the dose really, I think, has a big effect on how rapamycin affects the immune system. I also believe that the uh, the context of the individual has a big effect. And, and the reason I'm saying that specifically is organ transplant patients are never only taking rapamycin. They're always going to be taking strong immunosuppressants in addition to rapamycin, high-dose rapamycin. So it's, it's, it's unclear to me 
even in those patients, if they were to take organ transplant doses of rapamycin, how immune suppressive it, it would be? I think we just don't know the answer to that. At least I don't know the answer to that. So, so rapamycin is, is immune modulating. And this gets to, I think, a, a, a point that I, that I kind of alluded to, but I didn't explicitly state, which is that the on, a, on any given rapamycin regimen, whether we're talking about mice, worms, humans, any given rapamycin regimen, the impact, so rapamycin again, inhibitor of mTOR, the impact of rapamycin on mTOR activity is going to be different in different cell types or different tissue types. The immune system is highly responsive to rapamycin, T cells in particular, at least that's my understanding, highly sensitive to rapamycin. In part, that may be because it's easier for rapamycin to target the immune system because it's going to get into circulation. I think also in part, it's because mTOR activity is very important for maturation of immune cells, differentiation of immune cells, and then the ability of those immune cells when activated to carry out their job. And so rapamycin has a very potent effect on the immune system. That's not all it's doing. You take rapamycin, sure, it's going to hit your immune system. It's also going to hit your liver. It's going to hit your muscles. It's going to hit, probably hit your brain. We could talk about the brain. That's also an area where it's interesting because it's there's questions about bioavailability of rapamycin to the brain. The point being, though, that I think the immune system is just uh, one of the more sensitive parts of the body to, to rapamycin. And that's partly why we see more effects on the immune system. It's more obvious, right? The effects that's having on the immune system. Okay. So I know, again, that was a bit of a tangent, but it's useful, I think, to set the stage because going in, so I mentioned this 2009 study from Pan Zheng's lab, going into that study, I think almost everybody would have would have predicted that mice on rapamycin would be immune compromised and be more sensitive to immune challenges. That would be the prediction if rapamycin is an immune suppressant, right? I think, and again, <laughs> this I think is actually really a useful thing for people to appreciate. If somebody tells you rapamycin is an immune suppressant, and you point out to them, not only the study from Pan Zheng's lab, but there are probably a dozen studies showing that depending on the type of immune challenge, rapamycin actually causes a, a better immune response. That is completely inconsistent with the idea that rapamycin is an immune suppressant, right? It's the opposite of what you would predict. And yet you still hear, hear people say that. So I, I think, again, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a terminology problem. It's also a lack of awareness of the actual data. Okay, so, so going into this study, 2009, I think most people would have said, you give mice rapamycin, they're going to be immune compromised. They'll be more sensitive to an immune challenge. They, they will not respond well to a vaccine. Um, so that would have been the prediction. So the experiment, and it's a really elegant experiment. So in this particular case, um, they were looking at the effect of aging, chronological aging, biological aging, on the ability of the mouse immune system to respond to a flu vaccine. Okay, right, this was 2009, this was before COVID-19. We would probably do COVID-19 if it was today, but this was influenza. By the way, influenza is still an important infectious agent. Um, so, so they asked the question, what would the impact be of aging on response to a flu vaccine? And then how does rapamycin modify that, right? And again, we would have predicted rapamycin would make it worse. Okay, so the outcome of that experiment is a really, really cool experiment. So the way this was set up is there are young mice that either don't get a vaccine or get a flu vaccine. Uh, young mice, probably, I don't remember, six or nine months. I don't remember exactly how young they were. Um, and then there are old mice. All of the old mice get the flu vaccine. Half of them get rapamycin, half of them get a vehicle control. Okay. So they get a vaccine. They've either been treated with rapamycin, pre-treated with rapamycin for six weeks or pre-treated with vehicle for six weeks. Then they get the vaccine. And then you wait two weeks and then you challenge them with influenza. Okay. And this is a lethal dose of influenza in this case, meaning that the young mice that didn't get the vaccine all died within eight days, hundred percent lethality within eight days of, of challenge. Okay. Young mice that got the vaccine all survived to the end of the experiment, okay? 100%, and really all that means is vaccines work, right? At least if you're a young mouse. So the immune system did what it was supposed to do, responded to the vaccine, the mice were protected. Okay, that, those are the controls, that all makes sense. So now what happens in the old mice? This is the interesting part of the experiment. An old mouse that did not get rapamycin, so only got the vehicle control, 
then got the vaccine, then you wait two weeks, and then you challenge with influenza, about 70, 60 to 70 percent of those mice fail to respond to the vaccine and die with exactly the same kinetics as the young mice that did not get the vaccine. Okay, Clearly, I don't think there's any other possible interpretation except that the aged immune system, about 60 to 70 percent of the time in mice at 24 months of age, is unable to mount a response to a vaccine because of aging and then the mice died. 30% of the mice mounted the expected response and survived. And I think that's interesting biology. We know this in people. Why do some people show strong vaccine response and other people don't, especially in the elderly? It's interesting biology. I would argue it's probably related to the biology of aging. Um, so here's the other interesting part of this experiment though. Again, remember the prediction, rapamycin should make it worse if it's an immune suppressant. So the mice that got rapamycin for two weeks, then the vaccine, then the challenge, 100% protected. These are old mice. So it goes from 30% protected, 70% dead, to 100% protected, 0% dead. At least for this measure of immune function, fully rejuvenated the ability of the aged immune system to respond to a flu vaccine. So that's super striking, right? And I think we now have some evidence. You, you, I think you mentioned before, before we started recording that you're going to talk to Joan Manick, right? So we have some evidence in people, I think, that suggests that the same thing is probably possible in people. Is it going to be to the same magnitude? I, I don't think we know that yet. But I think there's pretty good evidence that inhibition of mTOR pharmacologically in older humans can actually boost influenza vaccine response. So, so, so this is... I, I think you know one of like, the most clear and compelling cases that at least in this context, and we should talk about the context because I think it's important, but at least in this context where you do a pretreatment with rapamycin before you give the vaccine, rapamycin is actually immune rejuvenating, not immune suppressant. Um, and and I, again, I think there's pretty good evidence in people that's probably true to some extent as well. The context, though, I think is also important. And this is an experiment that, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has done. I really wish it had been done because I think it, again, will give us some insights into how rapamycin is affecting the immune system in mice and potentially how it might be affecting the immune system in people is, I think, a really interesting variation of that experiment would be if instead of the two-week pretreatment and then stopping the rapamycin treatment, you treated with rapamycin all the way through. So rapamycin before the vaccine, rapamycin during the vaccine, rapamycin during the flu challenge, right? You treat all the way through and see what the effect is. Would it be different? I don't know. I, I mean, I could, I could imagine all possible outcomes. I could imagine that you actually lose the benefit, the immune rejuvenating benefit. You actually get a better benefit, or maybe it doesn't matter. It would be nice to have that data. We'll probably talk about it. I think we've got some hints. And again, they're just hints because of, because of the nature of the data. I think we've got some hints from the survey uh, study that I've been involved in recently where we collected data from people who've been taking rapamycin off-label and looked at COVID-19 infections and severity of outcomes. I think we've got maybe some hints that taking rapamycin all the way through, at least in the context of COVID-19, could actually provide confer some, some benefits in terms of likelihood of severe infections or long COVID symptoms. But really, you know, what we need are the well-controlled studies. And mice are a perfect place to do this because we already know what the, what the data look like. You do the transient pretreatment. Now we just need somebody to do the treatment all the way through. And of course, you can imagine variations. You know, you might want an arm where you only treat through the vaccine and not during the challenge, right? I think all those things would be super interesting and, and you know, it's just it's missing data that we don't have right now. Yeah. And also one uh, one arm that will be also very interesting to look at is that uh, only rapamycin without the vaccine. Yeah, right. I think you're absolutely right. So, you know, in the absence of a vaccine, does rapamycin impact the challenge with, with influenza? For sure. And that, I, I'm glad you said that because, because it's really smart and it makes sense. And I think there's some, there's some evidence to support the idea that rapamycin activates antiviral gene expression. So we don't know for sure that it's antiviral function. Although again, Joan can talk more about this, it's her data. Um, there's some evidence for, for antiviral function as well, but certainly at the gene expression level, just treating with rapamycin or other mTOR inhibitors can increase antiviral gene expression. You might actually get protection against certain viral challenges. And there's other data to support this in mice just from rapamycin itself independent of the vaccine. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're spot on. 
Um, regarding the immune uh, modulator effect of uh, rapamycin, um, one thing that you mentioned was that um, uh, during aging, uh, the immune system declines, but it's not that easy. Well, right. uh, can you can you talk a little bit about uh, how the immune system evolves uh, when we get older? Sure. So yeah. So first of all, if I if I said that, I broke my own rule of <laughs> trying not to say that the immune system declines. But but I, I mean, we all do it, right? So yeah, you make a good point. It's not that simple. Um, the other thing I'll say is. I'm not an immunologist, so I'm going to talk about this at the level of a non-immunologist. I'm sure there are I'm sure immunologists could really do a much better job of describing how the immune system changes with age. What I would say is, you know, what we see at a functional level is two things happening in parallel. There is a decline in the ability of the immune system to respond to to pathogens that it is evolved to respond to. So things like bacteria viruses, right? That the immune system is supposed to fight off. There is an, a, a lower ability on average with age in our immune systems to do that. What's happening in parallel though, is a hyperactivation of the immune system towards cell. So we hear sterile inflammation, age-related inflammation. Those are both just different words for autoimmunity, mostly. What we have with age is a hyperactivation of the immune system against stimuli that it would not normally respond to. And so it's this, I would say it's more of an imbalance than it is a true decline in immune function. But what that imbalance, and, and those things are coupled, right? So I also believe that the data are pretty strongly supportive of the idea that part of the reason why the immune system loses the ability to respond to true pathogens is because we've got this hyper-inflammatory autoimmune reactivity going on, right? So, so the, the, the hyperactivation of the immune to self is actually impairing the ability of the immune system to respond to pathogens. The other thing that I think is important to, to explicitly call out here as well is one of the really important jobs of the immune system, especially early on in life, is to surveil for early cancers, right? So we don't know, I, I don't think we know yet how many cancers are actually caught by the immune system before they become a problem. But I think most people believe it's the majority, at least when you're young. And it seems very likely, and there's evidence to support this, that part of the reason, not the entire reason, but part of the reason why we see this exponential increase in most cancers with age is in part because of the inability of the immune system to do that particular job of cancer surveillance. And, you know, all of the cancer immune therapies are based on kind of reharnessing the immune system's ability to recognize cancers and get rid of them through artificial means. So, um, so, so again, I think the key take home is it's an imbalance in the immune system, not a true overall decline. So, so how does this tie into rapamycin? Well, you know, it turns out that rapamycin is quite potent at, at least this is my, this is my interpretation of the data. Now I should say an immunologist might disagree with me, my interpretation of the data and what I've seen is that rapamycin is particularly potent at knocking down sterile inflammation, so autoimmunity, maybe specifically in the context of aging, although I think there's, there's, there's data out there in a variety of mouse models that in mouse models of autoimmunity, rapamycin can be effective as well. So it might not be a specifically age-related phenomenon. It just turns out that increase in sterile inflammation is strongly age-related and driven by the biology of aging. So rapamycin is very potent at knocking that down. This restoration of immune function that we talked about, at least for flu vaccine, might actually be mostly because of rapamycin knocking down that sterile inflammation and not so much a true boost in, in this case, vaccine response or maybe antiviral uh, uh, gene expression. So, so I don't think we know at this point, but I would I would guess that much of the what appears to be a rejuvenating effect on immune function from rapamycin in the context of aging is driven by knocking down sterile inflammation or age related auto autoimmunity. Um, and I think again, most of the data that I've seen, even some of the anecdotal uh, information that comes from people you know who've been using rapamycin off label, many if not most of the anecdotal stories of you know strong improvements are related to inflammation and knocking down inflammation 
The other place where I think we get a lot of anecdotal stories of strong improvement is in specific types of heart disease. Those seem to be the places where among people who feel like they have seen an effect of rapamycin, you know, you, you get the most common uh, reports. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, if we look at uh, one uh, big uh, project that uh, you're working on, um, it's uh, the dog aging uh, project. Uh, can you tell our listeners a little bit uh, about uh, that project? Sure. So the dog aging project is um, what we call a large scale longitudinal study of aging. And so what I mean by that longitudinal in this context really just means following individual dogs uh, over time. Uh, and the goal is really to try to understand, there are really two goals. The first goal is really to try to understand what are the most important genetic and environmental factors that influence the biology of aging in dogs and specifically lifespan and health span metrics. Um, and though that's just an observational study, we're not, and these are all companion dogs, pet dogs. I use those words interchangeably, companion dogs living at home with their owners, right? So they're not laboratory dogs. These are, these are dogs in the human environment living with their families. Okay, so the goal of the longitudinal study is really to follow as many dogs as possible over time, collect as much data as we can from those dogs and try to understand what are the genetic and environmental factors that influence aging in pet dogs. The second part of the dog aging project is to try to do something about aging in pet dogs. And specifically, we are uh, carrying out a double blind randomized placebo controlled veterinary clinical trial of rapamycin with the goal of determining does rapamycin increase lifespan and health span metrics in companion dogs. So those are really the two pieces of the dog aging project. The longitudinal study is, is, is much, much larger than the clinical trial, kind of, you know, not surprisingly. There are, we're getting close to 45,000 dogs now in the longitudinal study. So dogs in the longitudinal study are part of what we call the dog aging project pack. Um, uh, and, uh, and we're starting to, you know, make, I think some really interesting observational dis discoveries from that data set. Um, uh, we're just finishing, we're in the year, I think, I think we're finishing year four of the project once we got the large NIH grant. Uh, so we're still in pretty early days, but now we're finally starting to get to the point where we have, you know, large data sets coming in. And also, I should mention the dog aging project is, is what we call an open science project. So all of the data that we collect is made publicly available to the community um, for free uh, every year. And so we have now done, I think, two data releases to the, to the scientific community already. And annually, we will be updating that data set. And in part, that's because there's just more data than our team can possibly you know, do all of the cool analyses you could imagine doing. So we want other people to dive into it and, uh, um, and, and you know, make new discoveries. So if there are any data scientists listening, the website is dogagingproject.org. All you have to do is go to, you know, there's data access tab. I think it's in the upper right-hand corner of the website. There's a very easy, easy data use agreement. Complete that and you, you can go to town, go, go for it. Um, so, so we want to make, we want to make the data you know, as as uh, as easy to access and useful as possible. I really like uh, that part uh, of that project. That uh, it's uh, open uh, data, which uh, then uh, then people can start uh, collaborating. Yeah, and we're open to collaborations as well. But but I also think that it's going to be much more powerful if other people you know, can really dive into the data, they can develop their external collaborations, but, but really take advantage of that, that resource. Because um, you know, I think it's only gonna become more and more powerful as we add additional years, additional longitudinal data on the same dogs right, over time. So, so thank you for that. I, I think there are really two features of the Dog Aging Project that are kind of unique in that context. One is the open science aspect. And I mean, the reality is in the scientific community, a lot of studies that call themselves open science actually make it really, really hard to get access to the data. We're trying not to do that. We're trying to make it as easy as possible. The other is this is this is a community science project, right? Uh, or citizen science, depending on which team, term you pr prefer. All of the owners in the dog aging project pack are participating in the data collection, right? So they are true community scientists. And I think this project has engaged a lot of people both in scientific research in general, but in geroscience or the biology of aging in particular, 
in a way that, you know, I don't, I don't think there's another study out there that, that has sort of a comparable, a, a comparable way to get people interested, right? This is about their dogs of which many, maybe most, probably most dog owners consider their dog part of their family, right? So, so this, I think is really a, a powerful project for engaging the general public in geroscience and the biology of aging and starting to understand that there is a biology of aging and why is that important? And oh yeah, my dog ages seven times faster than I do, right? Roughly. That, that, age, that there is a biological aging rate and that different animals age at different rates. And oh yeah, different people age at different rates. And oh yeah, maybe we can do something about that, right? I think these are all concepts that the general public still doesn't really get. We're getting there. Certainly the field is getting more attention. I think you can legitimately ask whether that attention is net good or net bad at this point, but it's getting more attention. And so I think we can do our part at the Dog Aging Project to help communicate to the general public in a positive way, both science in general and the science of, of aging. One, uh, one interesting uh, finding uh, that was done quite uh, recently, I think it was, it was uh, regarding time-restricted eating. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that uh, data? Sure. Yeah, so the basis for that, that study was, of course, you know, the, the literature around caloric restriction and then variations of caloric restriction uh, and their impact on longevity and, and health span in, in mice mostly, but also, you know, in people uh, by extension. So, so what we know from the mouse studies is caloric restriction can, depending on the genetic background, can extend lifespan very robustly, certainly even more than rapamycin in certain genetic backgrounds. Um, there has been a, I think, I think, a uh, question in mice whether intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding can have similar effects on lifespan, and if so, whether those effects are due to caloric restriction or the period without food independent of total calories. We published a review on this. If people are interested, it was published in Science about a year ago. Um, it's called Anti-Aging Diets, Separating Fact from Fiction. I'm, I'm not going to go into the, all of the details there. I'll just give you our take home. Our take home was that when you really look closely at the mouse data, there's very little evidence that intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding has pro-longevity benefits independent of caloric restriction. So when you do both, you definitely get lifespan extension, at least in most genetic backgrounds. When you only do intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding without caloric restriction, very little, if any, lifespan effect. If you, interestingly, since we published this review, some studies have come out, if you do caloric restriction without intermittent fasting, you still get some of the benefits, but you don't get all of the benefits. So there is this component of when you eat that is important for the caloric restriction benefits. I think the take home though, for most people, uh, if we even assume that you can translate this from mice to humans, there's not a lot of evidence at this point that intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding has pro-longevity benefits unless you also calorically restrict, if you're a mouse. We don't know in people. So that was our take home from that study. But it occurred to me as we were writing this review that dogs are sort of this interesting place where we have a natural population where different dogs are fed a different number of times a day because different owners do different stuff, right? Of course, the composition of the diet is gonna be hugely important. We didn't look at that, but we did ask the simple question. If we just look in our pack, at this point, I think there were 20, 25,000 or so dogs in that data set. We just look in the pack, what's the frequency of feeding? And it turned out, you know, maybe not surprisingly, it's like about 75, 80% of owners in the United States in the pack feed their dogs twice a day. And that's, if you look on the, the recommendations on the dog food, most of them, that's what they recommend. That's what most vets will tell you to do. For historical reasons, I don't think, I don't know. I don't think there's any real scientific rationale for twice a day feeding in dogs. I think it's just what's evolved, you know, culturally in, in, in the veterinary world and in dog food manufacturers. But that's the reality. Most people, uh, about three quarters, feed their dogs twice a day. But about 10% feed their dogs once a day, about 10% feed their dogs three times a day. And then the other 5% do actually ad libitum. So they let their dogs eat whenever they want to. At least that's what they reported. And that, there are some interesting self-selection on the ad libitum. I think we can, we can exclude those dogs for now because I don't, I think that, that 
there are only certain dogs that are going to be able to be fed ad libitum and not, you know, blow up into to canine blimps, right? So, um, so anyways, we just asked the, the very, very simple sort of first order question, which is, if we look at the dogs fed once a day, and we compare them to dogs fed more than once a day, and we look at 10 different types of age-related disorders, is there a difference in the likelihood that a dog had been previously diagnosed with one of those age-related disorders? And I'm being very careful how I say that, because I think it is important for people to appreciate the nature of the data that we were using. And most of the data in the Dog Aging Project at this point comes from owner surveys, right? So we asked the owners once a year, a bunch of questions. And among those questions is, has your dog been diagnosed with disease X? And we have a long list of diseases, right? So that's the data that we've got. We know how often the owner says they fed the dog and whether the owner says the dog has been diagnosed with disease X. And so what we can ask from that data is, if we look at the different groups, once a day versus more than once a day, how often did the owner say their dog had disease X? And, and the statisticians in the group came up with, you know, and the veterinarians came up with 10 age-related disease categories. That's what we used. Okay. I didn't think this was going to work. And I just got done telling you why, because the mouse data, I didn't find particularly compelling. Um, but it turns out <laughs> that for all 10 of the disease categories, the dogs fed once a day had a lower likelihood of having been previously diagnosed with that age-related disease. And for seven of the 10, uh, it was statistically significant. So the other three, the trend was in the right direction, but it didn't reach statistical significance. So that's the kind of thing where there are lots and lots of caveats with that data, it needs to be replicated in another population. That's the kind of result where I look at it though, and I go, that's probably real. <laughs> because if they were all going the same direction. And, you know, in most of the cases, it was a big enough effect that it passed our pretty stringent statistical criteria. So I think that's a real correlation between how often dogs are fed, at least when you compare once a day versus more than once a day, and likelihood of disease diagnosis. Now, the trickier question gets, is that causal, right? Is it the case that once a day feeding is actually promoting health, reducing disease risk or not? We can't answer that. It could be. It could also be that there's some other factor that is associated with once a day feeding, maybe causally, that is also causally leading to the differential disease diagnosis risk. The easy thing to think about is obesity. I speculate, and, and we don't know yet, but I think we will have this information hopefully soon. I speculate that dogs fed once a day are less likely to be obese. And we know both in dogs and humans, first of all, that obesity is quite prevalent. And second, that obesity is associated with higher risk for a bunch of age-related diseases and, and reduced mortality. So one easy explanation is that it's really that obesity correlation that's driving the, the relationship that we saw. But you know that's speculation. It could also be that once a day feeding in dogs is intermittent fasting, and that's leading to effects on the biology of aging. We just don't know at this point. Um, will this project also look at uh, the life uh, span on uh, on these uh, dogs? For example, uh, will you see that uh, the time restricted uh, eating will have some lifespan effects? Yeah, I mean, assuming assuming the study continues long enough, and that's certainly our hope and expectation. Yes, we will we will get over the next five years, ten years for sure you know, uh, uh, enough of that cohort getting old and aging and eventually dying that we will be able to, to assess whether there's a relationship between frequency of feeding and mortality. Um, I suspect, you know, maybe even within the next two or three years, really depends on the statistics, right? So, you know, I suspect that within certainly the next five years, maybe even within two or three years, enough of the dogs in the upper age range will in fact, die, right? And we will have mortality data where we can at least make some initial initial projections, right? And uh, and and assess at that point whether it looks like there's a an effect on mortality. You know, the data set that we used in that first paper was uh, what what's called cross-sectional. So I defined longitudinal before. Longitudinal is multiple measurements on the same individual dogs over time. Cross-sectional is when you just look across the population at one time point. 
And so that data set that we used for that study was our first year data set. So all we had was one survey on each dog, about 25,000 dogs. So now that we have transitioned into truly a longitudinal study and every year we're collecting data on the dogs that are already in the study, we'll be able to start to make some of those kinds of, uh, do those kinds of analyses and, and, and draw those correlations on things like mortality or disease risk over time, things like that. And the rapamycin uh, trial in the dog uh, aging project, is it uh, possible to apply to, uh, to it or is it closed or? Yeah, so we're still recruiting. I think, you know, this has been one of the real, one of the real challenges. I mean, I think like everybody, right, uh, uh, the dog aging project was um, challenged with with what went on with COVID-19, right? So, you know, the, the year we got the grant, it was about one year from the from when we got the grant and we could really start to build the longitudinal study and start to plan for the clinical trial that COVID-19 hit. It was actually 18 months after we got the grant. Of course, all the veterinary clinics shut down, right? They had staffing issues. They were only taking emergency cases. So, so we really were delayed, I think disproportionately for the clinical trial because of COVID-19 and the impact that it had on clinical practice. Um, so, so we have really only started ramping up recruitment really this calendar, this calendar year. Last year we recruited uh, probably we screened over a hundred dogs, but but many of the dogs screened out of the trial. I can but we can talk about the design if, if people are interested, but there's a process to be eligible. Uh, and then the owners bring their dogs to one of the veterinary teaching hospitals. And then there's the eligibility exam. And, and one of the things about our rapamycin clinical trial that's a bit unique is in order to be eligible to start the trial, the dog can't have a significant pre-existing age-related condition, right? So this is a study of normal aging. So we have lots of dogs screen out at the eligibility trial because they have some pre-existing condition that we didn't know about, right? So not every dog that's screened makes it in. But the, the short answer to your question is, we are absolutely still enrolling dogs into the trial. And I would definitely encourage people, again, dogagingproject.org, please go to the website. If you have a dog, so that, so first of all, if you have a dog, please consider joining the Dog Aging Project. For the rapamycin trial, there are some specific uh, criteria around age and weight. So not every dog is eligible for the rapamycin trial, which is called triad for test of rapamycin in aging dogs. So to be eligible for triad, dogs have to be between 40 and 110 pounds, and they have to be at least seven years old at the time of the uh, baseline visit, right, to, to be randomized and enrolled in the trial. And the owners have to be willing to bring their dog to one of our clinical sites six times over the next three years. So the, the, the commitment is every six months, the dog will come in for an exam because we're, we're interested in lifespan, certainly, but we're also interested in health span. And the way that we can measure, you know, as many health span metrics as possible is to actually have the dogs come into the clinic and get a full assessment. So, so all of the clinical work is paid for. The owners don't have to pay for any of that, but they have to be willing to bring their dog to one of our clinical sites. We're expanding clinical sites. The clinical sites are on the website. So you can see if that, that works for you. Um, the only other limitation, I know probably many of the people watching this are going to be international. For now, the Dog Aging Project is, is only open to dogs in the United States. That's something I hope to change, but that's the situation for now. So it's also going to be restricted to, to people who live in the United States. But definitely, if people are interested in participating in the, the overall project, or specifically in the rapamycin trial, um, you know, please consider nominating your dog to participate. I encourage uh, people uh, to uh, take that uh, step because uh, uh, you do a, a contribution to the longevity field and uh, you also do a good contribution to the dog's uh, health also. So yeah, I will uh, put up the links to the uh, dog aging project and uh, how you can apply to it. Thank you. Uh, and. Um, if we look at the uh, dose protocol for the rapamycin uh, trial in the dog uh, aging uh, project, uh, is the dosing similar to what the, the doses are used in the longevity field for humans? So that's the, so that, that's challenging to answer for a couple of reasons. 
One is the dosing in the longevity field for humans is all over the map. So we could talk about that. People are trying all sorts of stuff. So to say that, you know, what we're doing in dogs is, is you know, mapping onto that, I think is, is challenging. So what I would say is um, uh, in some ways it, it parallels kind of what most people who are using rapamycin off-label have settled on in the sense that we're using once weekly dosing. The dose in dogs is 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. I don't think we can, I, I, I don't think you can draw straight extrapolations from that, you know, just in the weight to dose from dogs to humans. The blood levels that we anticipate, you know, are, are in the right range. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're going to get detectable levels uh, for about the first day after dosing. And the detection limit is, it's, it's uh, was it one nanogram per mil, I think on the, the mass spec assay. So it's probably a little bit lower than what most people are doing. The dogs also metabolize rapamycin differently than people do. So this is why I think it's hard to, it's really hard to draw direct parallels, just like it's hard to draw parallels from the mouse dosing to humans. So I would say we're, I think we think we're in the right ballpark. Part of the reason why we settled on the dosing protocol that we're using for triad was based, it's based on two things, right? And this is what you have to do for any clinical trial. You have to balance likelihood of efficacy with risk, right? Likelihood of adverse events. So the dosing protocol that we settled on was really an attempt to, to appropriately balance those things. Now, of course, with efficacy, we don't have a lot of guidance on what the right dose is for efficacy. Number one, we don't know if it's going to be efficacious, right? Um, and there isn't a lot of data in dogs. So we were guided by some cancer studies that were going on at the time um, as part of what, what was called the Canine Oncology Trials Consortium, or COTC, where they were testing rapamycin for osteosarcoma and I think hemangiosarcoma in dogs. So we were targeting their dosing protocol uh, in our first clinical trial, which was really a safety trial. So we tested, and they were doing three times a week, <laughs> three times a week uh, at 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram and 0 0.05 milligram per kilogram. I think those were the doses they were testing. So that's what we did for our first 10-week trial. And we saw that at both of those doses, um, very few adverse events, no real adverse events, and uh, some evidence for improvement in cardiac function. So then we went and tested a lower dose for six months in dogs, that study has been submitted. It's not, it, it's still under review. Uh, and again, saw no adverse events. We saw some evidence for improved activity and owner reported uh, changes that they considered positive, but we didn't see the heart function changes that we had seen in the first 10 weeks. We, we saw some different heart function changes. I don't wanna make any claims about benefit or not, but they weren't the same ones that we saw. So we decided that for triad, we would increase the dose back up to one of the doses we had tested in the first study. But we also at the same time went to once a week instead of three times a week, being guided in part by Jones studies, which I'm sure you'll talk with her about, you know, being guided in part by the anecdotal that the data that we were hearing from people on rapamycin, also recognizing that 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 it would be uh, easier for own because the owners are giving the medication to their dogs, right? It would be easier for owners, less opportunity for mistakes if they dosed the dogs less frequently. So all of those things went into weighing why did we settle on the dose that we settled on? You know, if anything keeps me up at night about this trial, one of the there are two things. One is did we pick the right dose? Um, and the other is, did we actually shoot ourselves in the foot by having too healthy of a cohort coming into the study? I mentioned previously that dogs get excluded at the baseline visit if they have any, any pre-existing age-related disease. Of course, that's not a true representation of the normal population. And in fact, I think we probably have what's called a healthy cohort bias, where the dogs coming into the study are more healthy than you would expect for their chronological age on average. That could reduce the benefit of rapamycin if there's going to be a benefit of rapamycin. So those are the two things that I think really concern me about the way that we, you know, have have set up this study. But this is this is kind of the way it works in clinical trials. You have to make key decisions, um, do the best you can with the information you have, and move forward. And so you know that we'll we'll see when we get to the end of the day fortunately i think we're looking long enough and we're looking at enough age related endpoints that 
if rapamycin has benefits in dogs, I think we've got a pretty good chance of being able to see it. I had an interview with uh, Dr. Alan Green um, some weeks ago, and uh, one thing he said uh, was that uh, from his uh, clinical experience is that uh, the best effects that he saw on his uh, patient pool was on the healthy patients. So that was uh, interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. I mean, again, you know, it's it's hard to know. I think I certainly recognize Alan has a huge amount of experience in this area that I don't have. Um, that goes against my prediction, but, you know, who knows, right? We, again, we don't have the data. That would be super interesting if, if that was the case. Um, and certainly there may be, you know, a uh, uh, with a lack of a better way of saying it, kind of a U-shaped curve, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, maybe it's the people in the middle. If you think about, you think about quality of health as a continuous function, right? It might be the people in the middle that get the best effect. The people who are super healthy might not get much of a benefit. This is all speculation, right? So it, they might not get much benefit. And the people who are super unhealthy might not get much, much benefit because they're already, you know, past the point of no return for lack of a better way of saying it. Or they're unwilling to do the other things that go along with Im improving your health. So yeah, it could be the case that that healthy people get more benefit, unhealthy people get more benefit. My intuition in the absence of data is probably more going to be the dogs or people in the middle that are going to see the biggest delta uh, when we look at different health metrics. I should say, if you go back and look at that first 10-week study that we did, we did echocardiograms on all of the dogs, and we were looking at three specific measures of left ventricular function. Um, and that was based on mouse data showing that they could reverse the age-related changes in those measures. So for two of the three, the effects of rapamycin were a statistically significant improvement. But when you look at the individual dogs, the dogs that showed the improvement over 10 weeks of rapamycin were the ones that came in with the lowest baseline values. So it seems in that study, at least, that the dogs that had the lowest function were the ones that got the benefit. The ones that had high function coming in didn't see any, any change. Um, but it is important to note, those are dogs who are all in the normal range, right? So these are within the reference range, you can see differences in function. They're all considered normal, meaning they don't have heart disease, but you can see differences in function within the reference range. So if we had had diseased dogs coming in, that may, might be a very different situation. Maybe we would see much bigger benefits, or maybe if rapamycin doesn't affect that particular disease, you wouldn't see any benefit at all. Uh, this goes a little bit uh, to the next uh, area here. Um, if we look at the side effects on humans, uh, you have been working on a, on a study in that area, but uh, the results are not uh, published yet. Uh, right. Yeah, I mean, I can share them. I, I don't, you know, I, people just have to appreciate these are, this is unpublished data. It's undergoing peer review right now. I'm hopeful that it will be published soon, but it's not published yet. So, so just appreciate that, that aspect of it. So first of all, again, you know, with every study, it's important to understand how the study was done and the limitations of the data type. Okay, so the way this study was done, this was all survey-based. People were able to go to a website uh, uwrapamycinstudy.org. You can't go there now, so don't bother. <laughs> I mean, you can go there, but you can't complete the survey. Study's closed. Um, people could go to that website, ask to participate in the study. It was open to everybody, whether they had taken rapamycin previously or not. Um, complete the informed consent, and then people who completed the informed consent were invited to come take a, a, a survey about a bunch of different aspects of their, their health and their experiences and, and things like that. Um, so again, just appreciate these are, these are somewhat self-selected for people who heard about the study and we advertised as broadly as we could a bunch of different outlets, but there's gonna be some bias in the group of people who come to take the study. Um, uh, and it's all people reporting their own experiences, right? So in, in some ways it's, it's somewhat similar to the dog data that I talked about with once a day feeding. Those are the owners reporting it, not a veterinarian, it wasn't clinically validated, any of that. So there are some, some potential limitations to the quality of the data based on the nature of the way the study was designed. 
The other thing I think it's useful to appreciate is, well, there's two things. So we one of the things we asked was over the last, I think it was three months, have you experienced X? And we had a long list of potential side effects that included all the things that people talk about as side effects of rapamycin, you know, in, in organ transplant patients um, and otherwise. So we had a long list and we just asked people in the last three months, have you experienced this? And for some of them, there was a, you know, uh, a gradation from mild to severe, but let's just talk about it as yes, no for now, because that's the easiest analysis. So the comparison was, if we look across all the different potential side effects that, that, that we asked about, people who had taken rapamycin for at least 90 days, which was the length of the recall period, versus people who had never taken rapamycin. Um, I think there's a couple things to appreciate. One is, this may underrepresent the side effects of rapamycin because people who started taking rapamycin and stopped because they had side effects may be less likely to take the survey and tell us about it. That's that's one possibility. It may also overrepresent the side effects of rapamycin, at least certain side effects, because most people who are taking rapamycin off label have been trained to watch out for certain side effects, like mouth sores, like bacterial infections, right? Uh, I know I don't know if Alan talked about this, but it's it's my understanding that he routinely gives an, uh, a prescription to antibiotics to people that he prescribes rapamycin to and tells them you might get a bacterial infection. So people who are taking rapamycin off label are going to expect that they might get a bacterial infection, <laughs> whether they did or not. So this is the this is some of the challenges with the the data, right? Mouth sores are another interesting one. I don't, I don't know why I have always been somebody who periodically I bite the inside of my mouth and get a mouth sore from that. If I was on rapamycin, I might attribute that to rapamycin, but I know that I actually bite the inside of my mouth and, and do that, right? I mean, people get mouth sores all the time. So I think there is a bias, potentially both directions, and that's useful to appreciate. So, so what we saw, so then we just asked, again, very, very simple analysis. People who'd used rapamycin for at least the past 90 days, some of them have been using rapamycin for a couple of years, some of them only started a few months ago, okay? People using rapamycin at least the past 90 days from when they took the survey versus people who had never used rapamycin. What's the frequency of different side effects? Um, the only thing that was statistically significantly higher in the rapamycin users was mouth sores. And it looks real. Again, you know, that, that's just my, <laughs> that's my interpretation from having seen a lot of data. It looks real. So, so I think that's probably true. Rapamycin increases mouth sores, even in people using it off-label. Most people in our study, the, the, by far, the most common dose was six milligrams once a week. And, and I think that's, we can talk about how that evolved. I think in part, it's because a lot of the people taking our survey who are rapamycin users are Alan's patients. I think Alan is, that's typically what he'll, he'll prescribe, although I know he does other doses as well. So anyways, that's the most common dose. At that dose, it seems to me that there is a, an increased risk of mouth sores. It was, I think, about 15%. I can't remember for sure in the rapamycin group compared to around five, four or 5% in the rapamycin non-user group. So statistically significant. Nothing else was statistically significantly greater in the rapamycin group versus the non-rapamycin group. There were non-significant trends towards uh, bacterial infection, but it did not reach statistical significance. So, you know, there might be a slight higher risk of bacterial infection, but it's not, you know, fivefold, it's not tenfold, at least in this group. And again, I do wonder if that's overrepresented in the rapamycin group because people are sensitized to think they're going to get a bacterial infection, but I don't know that. Okay. So then the, I think the surprising thing to me was there were like five other things. I, sh I should have gone back and looked at the data because I knew you were going to ask me for this, but I haven't, I haven't looked at the data in a couple of months other than presenting it a couple of times. Um, there were like five or six things that were significantly lower in the rapamycin group, which are interesting. And they some of them are, are unexpected, like uh, stomach pain which is one of the side effects people point to with rapamycin, but actually significantly lower in the rapamycin group, at least in our survey. The ones that I think are most interesting are around depression and anxiety, because there is accumulating literature out there, both in mouse models and a little bit even in, in human clinical work in, in psychiatry um, for rapamycin and mTOR biology having an impact on things like depression, anxiety, autism. So brain biology in ways we don't understand 
Um, so I wonder if that's real, right? It, it, it's interesting to me that that came out uh, in our study. Again, obviously it could be something about the psychological makeup of people who are trying rapamycin off label versus people who aren't that those things are hard to disentangle but i thought those were interesting you know observations that certainly warrant further uh follow up but you know from my perspective the way i interpret the the data is it seems like off label use of rapamycin does not have high rates of any significant side effects unless and this is the thing we can't really control for unless the people who did experience side effects stopped taking it and didn't take our survey. And I, I don't I don't have a way to to rule that out at this point. Yeah, very, very interesting study. I, um, do, do you know when it will be published? So we haven't gotten the reviews back. It's been under review for probably three or four weeks. So I expect we'll get reviews back pretty soon. And then, you know, it's hard to predict in scientific publishing, you know, whether or not reviewers are going to want significant revisions, things like that. So hard to predict. I'm cautiously optimistic because the survey's done. I mean, I think reviewers can ask us to do other types of analyses or maybe modify the text and the way we interpret the data. They can't really ask us to do any more experiments. So I'm hopeful that whatever revisions the reviewers suggest, you know, we'll be able to, to, to carry out and do it in a timely fashion. So you know, hopefully within the next six weeks, I would be cautiously optimistic. Uh, very, very important uh, uh, step uh, forward there uh, through that uh, study. And uh, if we look at the other longevity interventions uh, uh, and uh, side effects uh, on that, uh, if, uh, if you use high doses of uh, any longevity intervention, uh, then then you get the side effects. Uh, and um, can you can you talk a little bit about that? That the the goal is probably not to get zero side effects, uh, or or what or what is your view on that? I, I don't know. I mean, so here's yes. Yeah, so you're right. Almost anything, not just longevity interventions, right? Almost any intervention, medication, you know, there's going to be a dose response and there comes a point where there are going to be side effects. I also think, you know, side effects, if you really think about what that means, all it means is something other than the intended effect of the intervention that you're going for, right? So if you're taking a drug to lower lipids, anything else that that drug does, then lowering lipids is a side effect, right? Side effects can be good, Side effects can be bad. We we tend to immediately interpret them as bad, but they don't have to be. They're just unintended. That's not the indication or the purpose that you're using that intervention for. Okay, so that's one thing I think it's useful to appreciate. Um, another thing that's useful to appreciate is even non-pharmacological interventions have side effects. Uh, so I've, I've you know I've, I've talked about this a few times, right? I think exercise is a super good example where. Anybody who has ever exercised vigorously should be able to recognize that there are side effects associated with exercise. Muscle pain is an obvious one the next day, right? Everybody has been sore after exercising the next day. That is a side effect. And if it was a drug that did, did that to you, it would be considered an adverse event of that drug. But because it's exercise, we don't think about it that way. It's just normal. That's what we expect. So even things like exercise, which you know, I'm, I'm hugely into exercise, right? it's useful to appreciate that there are side effects and risks associated with exercise. The side effects and risks are going to depend on the kind of exercise you do, the intensity that you do, all of that stuff, but there are side effects. Okay. So now does everything, so, so should we be shooting for a dose? So is the, maybe another way to say it is, is the optimal dose for a longevity intervention by necessity going to have negative side effects? I think that's what you were asking to some extent. I don't know the answer to that. My intuition is probably, I, I don't think, I think it's unlikely that there are, that there's going to be a free ride, right? So the, the biology of aging, right, is so interconnected to our overall physiology and function that it's difficult to imagine changing that biology in a way that is only going to, to lead to positive or beneficial outcomes. Maybe if we completely understood the system, 
we could do that in a very rational way. But again, this gets back to what we were talking about before. And, you know, my belief that we really understand the system of aging quite poorly. I think that the, especially the tools using it now are very crude. They're hammers. Rapamycin to some extent is, well, I think I've said this before. Caloric restriction is a hammer. Rapamycin is the precision tool, but we're still not very precise, right? Um, I think that we're still, we don't understand the biology of aging well enough to rationally say, here are all the things you should do to maximize the benefit and reduce the risk or the, the side effects. So yeah, I think for now, at least, pretty much every longevity intervention that is likely to have a benefit on, let's at least say future health outcomes. Again, we can argue whether it's really modifying the biology of aging, likely to significantly extend lifespan. But I think for things like at least exercise, proper nutrition, we can make a pretty good case that those are gonna have a positive benefit, benefit on future health outcomes and function as we get older. And I would, you know, I don't think we can say with 100% rapamycin is in that same camp, but I think many of us believe it probably is. So, so all of those things, yeah, I don't think we know enough to be able to say, here's exactly what you do. You're going to get all the benefits and you're going to get none of the side effects, none of the stuff you don't want. I, I, I don't think so. And, and again, you know, I want to go back because I think this is a useful illustration. I think we have gotten to the point where we have an opportunity to limit the side effects. So one of the things that we have learned over the last 15 years is that you can start a treatment later in life at least with rapamycin, and you don't even necessarily have to do it continuously later in life to get some, maybe most of the benefits, at least in mice, right? So I think the side effect profile from rapamycin in mice goes way down when we start the treatment at 20 months of age versus starting the treatment at six months of age. And so I think as we learn, that's a really good example of how, as we've learned more about the biology and different strategies for intervening, we can do more of a precision approach that still, again, at least in mice, gives you most of the benefits with a much lower likelihood of adverse effects. And that'll happen with time. We'll get better at this. We haven't talked much about biomarkers or biological aging clocks, which is sort of, again, that's, a, that's, not, a, that's not a very good term because people have co-opted it to mean what they want instead of what it actually means. But biomarkers of biological aging or aging rate, as those get better, those I think will help us develop precision interventions that will get closer to optimizing benefits and reducing risk. And uh, if we look about a little bit quickly on the biomarkers, are there uh, some certain uh, biomarkers that you think is good to keep an eye on to keep, uh, yeah, uh, risk uh, down? Well, I don't know about risk. I think certainly for uh, future health, you know, yeah, I think I think there are there are lots of biomarkers that people can 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 choose from, right? And and this is where this is kind of what I was getting at is people have kind of co-opted the term biological aging to fit their test, right? Or their biomarker and they'll claim X means biological aging, which is nonsense. It's a piece of biological aging. We don't know how much. So the ones that I look, I'm much more of a functional guy. Like I, I would much rather be functionally young than have a young epigenetic age. So I put more, I put, and I'm not saying you can't do both, right? We don't know, but I put more faith on, you know, functional measures, measures. And by that, I mean, you know, strength, uh, cardiovascular fitness, uh, but also organ function, tissue function, some of the blood metabolites and blood tests that we have. We have blood panels for kidney function, heart function, right? Imaging can look at functional measures of organs and tissues. I think for now, those are the things that I put the most weight in. But I think I'm very interested now, and, and part of what I'm doing, you know, currently is trying to evaluate, you know, how how well do these different diagnostics that we can look at, how well do they track with each other and track with, you know, what I would consider sort of overall optimal health. And optimal, I don't like that word because optimal implies you can't do any better. I don't think we really know what optimal means, but we can, we, we can get, we, we, we know, we know deltas, we know better health. So what are the most informative diagnostics and biomarkers for looking at current health status and predicting future health outcomes, right? And I think at this point, it's so early, we don't know, right? The, the epigenetic tests, there are multiple flavors of epigenetic tests. We don't know how well those, those are, are going to actually perform. And are they useful for testing interventions? 
Um, I kind of like the glycan age test. I'm going to just give a shout out to the glycan age folks. I'm, you know, again, it's early, but the data I've seen, I, I, it, it seems plausible. I like the fact that that particular test uh, is uh, sensitive to changes over about a three month period. So I think you can see deltas. So I don't want to make the case again, the name has age in it. I don't know how much that is truly a measure of biological aging. I'm cautiously optimistic that that test can be useful uh, for looking at the effect of interventions on future health outcomes, right? So I think, again, we have to be careful what we mean these, these tests to, to mean. Um, I'm interested in markers of immune senescence uh, and immune function. And there, again, there are a variety of ways you can probe that. You can look at inflammatory markers in the immune system, some of which you can get from a standard blood test, some of which you have to use more sophisticated measures for. So I think, and we've talked about why inflammation with age is important, I think being able to measure that quantitatively. And I think that there are some ways to do that now that are, that are getting better. I think there's going to be a lot there that is very, very powerful. Um, I also kind of like, you know, I don't want to say crude, but 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 the 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 easy measures of body composition, like DEXA. I think body composition is hugely important. Um, I, I'm guessing many of the people listening to this uh, are also also listen to Peter Atia's podcast. I think my views kind of align very well with Peter's on this. That uh, body composition as you're getting older is hugely important for for being able to maintain function into old age. And I think you can use things like DEXA. To, to give you a feel for where you're at and what are some of the things that you should be focusing on among all the things you could focus on going forward. And then six months later, you can ask, did you actually make a positive change in your body composition, right? And in there, I would put both lean mass, hugely important, bone mineral density, hugely important, right? And, and at least certain types of adipose depots, right? Like visceral adipose. So I think all of these things have value and, uh, you know, I'm a little bit concerned with the perception that is being put out there that we can measure everything with one spit test, right? And that's what you should focus on. I think that's, you know, there's no no good evidence to support that in my view. And this uh, goes a little bit uh, to the next uh, question. Uh, do you do you take your rapamycin? Periodically, yeah. In fact, it's interesting. So I've actually been off of rapamycin for probably about seven months now. And the reason for that is it has nothing to do with rapamycin. It has to do with kind of what I was just talking about, which is that I'm in the process of doing a pretty comprehensive baseline with, with many different diagnostics on myself. So I want to do my own N of one experiment, right? So I'm going to get a comprehensive baseline and then start my next cycle of rapamycin and then see how my biomarkers move. And in part, this is, you know, this is exploring, right? I mean, I think this is this is something a lot of people, I think most people who are using rapamycin off-label appreciate that they are experimenting on themselves, right? That there is not a lot of certainty here. Uh, and so, you know, I want to know for myself, how does rapamycin affect the different biomarkers, diagnostic measures that we have available, and then try to interpret it. Um, you know, for for example, I mentioned in passing immune senescence and immune exhaustion. So my hypothesis is that a cycle of rapamycin, a cycle, you know, we don't know what the optimal cycle is. Let's just say 12 weeks, 10 weeks, a cycle of rapamycin, if you have high immune senescence, should reduce it, right? Given what we know rapamycin does to senescent cells and senescent markers, that's a hypothesis, but we aren't going to know until we actually collect the data. So I'm collecting some of that data on myself. So the answer to your question is yes. Um, but I'm not at the moment, and I actually haven't been for the past, like I said, seven months or so. So um, soon will be again. And what uh, uh, those protocol will you use uh, when you start again? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, I'm doing this with a couple of other people who I won't name. You know, uh, keep, keep the, the the guilty <laughs> uh, 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 out of the public eye. Uh, so we're still tossing that around. It'll probably either be six or 10 MIGs once a week. I know a lot of people now have gone to once every two weeks. And look, again, this gets to the uncertainty, right? You know, I think a lot of people want to know, like, what's the right dose of rapamycin to use off-label? Number one, I don't know if there is a right dose, right? We don't know. Uh, but number two, you know, there's, we don't know if once every other week, once a week, once every few days, this gets to your question of optimization. Because we don't, because we don't know what to measure, to tell us what's optimal, 
um, it's hard to say what, what dose is optimal or what regimen is optimal. So people are doing different things, you know, many times based on reasonable ideas, but, but it's really a lot of speculation, right? And, and there's, there's no real guidance on what's best. So what I can, what I can tell you from my own personal experience, and, and I've talked about this before, and, and I know I know you were going to ask me about it anyway, so I'll talk about it. Is my personal experience with my um, shoulder inflammation, right? So I had uh, what's called adhesive capsulitis in, in my right shoulder. Um, was that rapamycin once a week for ten weeks fixed it, right? Or at least it was placebo effect. I can't rule that out. I don't think it was. So for that particular indication, right? Me personally, Matt Caberline's shoulder once a week, six migs a week had a positive effect. Is it going to be different for different conditions? Is it going to be different for different people? Was that optimal? I have no idea because it was my end of one experiment, right? So I think people really need to not only understand, but internalize how much uncertainty there is around this. And, there, you know, we just don't have hard answers. I think it's also useful to appreciate most of the prescription medications that people are taking. We don't have hard answers there either. All we know is that particular dosing protocol worked in a clinical trial so the company could get their drug approved by the FDA. In some cases where we have 20, 30, 40 years of data, those dosing guidelines have improved, but we never have drug optimization, almost, almost never, right? We ne almost never have drug optimization in the real world. So there aren't hard answers around what's optimal. You know, um, I, I wish I could give people those answers, but I don't have them. And uh, have you experienced any side effects uh, like mouth sores or anything? No, well, again, like I talked about before, I can't really attribute the mouth sores to the rapamycin because I tend to bite the inside of my mouth for some dumb reason. Um, no, uh, the answer is no. Nothing. I, I, I have never experienced anything that I would attribute to rapamycin uh, that that I would consider negative. Doesn't mean that it didn't happen. I just nothing that I noticed. I'm, I'm also not the most self-aware person in the world, so it's possible that I. <laughs> but I had some and I just didn't didn't pick up on it. But no, nothing that I can point to. And uh, if we look at the risk and the benefit uh, calculation on uh, rapamycin, uh, uh, why did you, for example, start with uh, rapamycin? Because it's uh, still early, as you, you talked about, and uh, not uh, taking uh, some other uh, longevity intervention. And uh, there are also... Uh, yeah, like uh, stem cell uh, therapy and uh, things like that. Uh... Yeah, so why wrap my... So first of all, I just thought of this. I assume you're going to have a medical disclaimer at the beginning, but I'm going to make one now. I'm not an MD. Nothing I say is medical advice. This is all just my personal opinion. I think, it, again, it's important for people to appreciate that because I do have, you know, I'm recognized as having some level of expertise on the topic. I don't want people to assume that they should go out and do what I did. Okay. So, um, so why did I why did I do rapamycin? So again, this really comes back to my personal uh, experience, right? So first of all, obviously, we talked about the fact that I've been studying aging for a long time, been working specifically on mTOR and rapamycin, you know, since two thousand four, two thousand three. Um, so I had a lot of experience in in that area. I knew the literature inside and out, um, uh, so I understood the drug, and I think. I don't think anybody can argue with the statement that rapamycin is the most robust and reproducible drug for increasing lifespan in laboratory animals. Many, many labs, many, many studies, effect size is consistently bigger than any other intervention out there, at least in terms of drugs. Caloric restriction, you can get bigger effects, some of the genetic models, but at least in terms of pharmacological agents, Rapamycin is the gold standard. I, I don't think anyone, honestly, who knows the literature can, can really dispute that statement. So that was part of it, right? But really, it was also that when I, when I was diagnosed with frozen shoulder, I didn't know what frozen shoulder was at the time. The specialist, you know, told me, well, there's no surgical, you know, reason to do surgery. Because I, I, I was kind of half hoping it was a torn rotator cuff because I just wanted it fixed, right? It hurt. Couldn't go across the street and throw a ball with my kid. I couldn't sleep. I wanted it fixed, <laughs> like most patients do. 
Um, and he's like, you know, there wasn't a surgical option. There isn't really a medic medication that you can take. Go back to physical therapy and maybe it'll get better. That was essentially what he told me. So of course I went and, you know, did my own learning about what frozen shoulder was. And when I realized it was a age-related inflammatory condition of the shoulder capsule, you know, of course I thought, well, okay. One of the things we know that seems to have a pretty potent effect on age-related inflammation is rapamycin. And again, I think because I was, you know, in that world, I had a pretty good understanding of the, the what I would say is closer to the true risk reward ratio than the average person at that time, probably the average person still. And I was pretty confident that, you know, in the, in the, that, that there were dosing regimens where the risk was very low. And in my case, the reward was pretty high. This was having a pretty significant impact on the quality of my life. So that's why I tried rapamycin. Um, it honestly wasn't so much for a possible longevity benefit <laughs> as it was to fix this stupid problem I had in my shoulder. Um, and that, that's why that's why I picked rapamycin. So, you know, I think we could have a discussion about for people who are, are you know, want to take interventions to improve longevity, how do you rank the various things that you might do? You know, what about combinations of things? Those are all super complicated questions. Again, it's lots of speculation because we don't have much data, but that wasn't the question for me, right? The, the question for me was, how do I fix my shoulder? Because it sucked. <laughs> That's all. We should do a, another interview on uh, how to self-experiment uh, in a good way. I think you can uh, give quite good insight in that uh, area. Yeah, I'd, yeah, be, be happy to. I mean, I think it's a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, world and and group of people. And you know, again, all sorts of different people, all sorts of different motivations, um, all sorts of different things that people are trying. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the one thing I would say about the self-experimentation is, you know, it's my hope. I think there's this perception that we can't learn anything from that. Right. Uh, and it's my hope that we can. And I think the study that we did with the survey, uh, of rapamycin users is an example of how you can actually collect. I mean, it's not going to prove, it's not going to prove to people like a clinical trial would, but I think it's useful data that can guide future development, future clinical trials, uh, and, and so I think it's a, it's a place where we should be spending more attention thinking about, you know, how do we actually take advantage of these people who are, who are out there self-experimenting? How can we enable them to capture their own data in ways that, that will be useful? And I think there's actually a lot to be done there that, that, that could be quite valuable. Do, do you feel that you're, you have got the deeper understanding about the rapamycin because you take it? Uh... Because um, I think uh, if you're a researcher, then it can be a little bit uh, uh, yeah. theoretical and abstract. But yeah. if you also practice it, you get a much deeper level. Uh, have you felt that or? No, no question. So, so absolutely, the answer is 100% yes. I do think also, though, it's useful. It's important to be mindful of, of the possibility that you also develop your own bias towards the positive potential aspects of taking a drug like rapamycin. So absolutely. Do I have a lot more confidence that at least in my N of one, there were no side effects and that that's probably going to be true for not everybody, but lots of other people? Yeah. Do I have pretty high confidence that at least for my N of one, it knocked down inflammation in my shoulder and probably will for some other people? Yeah, absolutely. So of course, you're going to have a different view from having you know, gone through that yourself than if, than if you didn't, right? I'm sure some of my colleagues, in fact, I know because they told me, some of my colleagues out there, you know, don't like the fact that I go talk about rapamycin in my experience. And, you know, that's okay. They can have their opinions. Um, I try to do it in a way that is balanced and honest, but certainly when you've gone through it yourself, you have a different appreciation, right? And again, I just want to make sure that I try to balance that with, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a rigorous and rational view of, you know, how my experience may also bias my, my interpretation of my own data and other people's data, you know, to be too positive about the drug. So it's hard, right? There's, you know, we all have our biases. We all have our own, you know, uh, 
the, the way that the, the information that we've got when we approach a topic, right, that influences the way we filter and and understand the 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 data that we see, it's hard to guard against that, you know, a hundred percent. But I try to I try to make sure that I'm not that I'm that I'm hopefully taking a balanced view. You're quite a humble uh, person, uh, is my feeling, and you point out uh, many times that lots of uh, the things we are view in the area is guesswork. That is something you point out. Uh, many times and so it's not uh, a fact like uh, this protocol will lead to 20% uh, uh, lifespan in humans it's uh, I think you have a quite uh, very good uh, approach uh, to this field so, thank you yeah. um, one uh, uh, you touched a little bit about the uh, calorie restriction as one of the top uh, longevity interventions and uh, then you uh, mentioned rapamycin what would you say is the third uh, best uh, longevity you're going to get me in trouble here <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's uh, it's a very interesting question to see if you look at multiple uh, species uh, what will you say uh, okay, so so the so the question was what's what's number three, right? I, I honestly I don't know. Um, I don't know that we have a clear number three, to be honest with you. So so the thing, at least in my view of like how confident am I, even in mice, right? That these things, and so again, let's let's be precise. We're going to take out the genetic models, right? So there are genetic models, you know, mutations where we have reduced growth hormone signaling in mice give very robust lifespan extension. So. So we're not going to talk about the genetic models. We're talking about now interventions, right? That are non-genetic, caloric restriction, uh, definitely the, the largest effect size that's been reported, but important to also note that it seems as though about one third of genetic backgrounds have no positive effect from a given caloric restriction regimen or have their lifespan shortened. So there's a strong genetic interaction with caloric restriction. And again, no idea whether that translates to humans. If it does, you know, you're, you're taking a chance. You might get a big benefit or you might get a negative effect. So just worth, worth noting. Okay, so then next in line, clearly in my view is rapamycin in terms of reproducibility, magnitude of effect, consistency, um, and, and the data across multiple tissues and organs, right? That rapamycin could have positive health span metric benefits. I think that's clearly number two. There's not an obvious number three in my book at this point. In part, that's just because there hasn't been that much data. You know, nobody has studied anything else to the extent that we've studied rapamycin and consistently found it to be reproducible. You could put a carbose there. I think you can make a pretty good case for a carbose because the interventions testing program has replicated a carbose, combined it with rapamycin. So at least in mice, you can make a pretty good case that a carbose is reproducible. Of course, there, the benefit, again, this is in mice, seems to be primarily in male mice. We don't know why, right? So, you know, if you're if you're weighing this in terms of like, what do we think is going to be true in people? I, I don't know what the sex difference means, but it's real in mice. So you could put a carbose up there. I think, you know, the, the NAD precursors, so that, so that, so, so, so there's, there's all this, this question of, you know, there's the mouse data and then there's the human data and they don't always line up, right? So I would say metformin and NAD precursors are places where there's interesting human data, even though the mouse data doesn't really seem to be all that compelling. Um, so, you know, metformin, again, there's differences of opinion. I think the data is a little bit mixed. Um, I mentioned Peter Atia. He recently did a podcast on on a, a newer study with metformin that called into question some of the prior uh, reports that that metformin had positive effects on mortality in, in people. So there's there's some there's some you know differences there. But I think if you look at the whole body of data on metformin in humans, you can make a pretty compelling case that metformin at least in diabetics, is strongly protective for mortality and other age-related diseases. The question is, is metformin in non-diabetics protective for mortality and age-related diseases? I, I think it's an open question. I don't think we really know. 
I also, then this is, this is touching on a, a, a point that we talked about earlier, which is that if you look across the population, right, in, in terms of functionality, if we think of uh, glucose homeostasis across that functional spectrum, you know, diabetes is up here at one end, but there are going to be people who are in this range, you know, who may or may not be, be called pre-diabetic. My intuition is those people will also get a pretty significant benefit from metformin. I'm not convinced that the people who have really, really good glucose homeostasis are going to get any benefit. And the other thing that's underappreciated about metformin is that there's side effects associated with metformin. Um, so, you know, again, it comes down to the risk reward. For diabetics, it's a great drug. For people who have, you know, super good glucose homeostasis, I don't think it's a great idea to be taking them, even if you're 80, right, taking metformin. So that's my own view on the data, but we don't really know. Um, NAD precursors are another one where we're starting to get some clinical trials that look interesting. So I, I, I am not uh, confident that NAD precursors are going to be beneficial broadly for the biology of aging, but I certainly think for a subset of people who, again, are challenged for NAD homeostasis, maybe in certain tissues and organs, maybe primarily in brain and muscle, for example, um, they could be quite beneficial for. So, so I, you know, I, I kind of put up, there are a lot of things in that category where, you know, it's just a little bit unclear at this point, either on the preclinical side in, in animal models or in humans, you know, what the real benefits look like um, or, or what the real risks look like. So again, I think with metformin, we have a pretty good feel for what the side effect profile looks like. Problem is most people don't appreciate what the side effect profile really is. NAD precursors, probably pretty safe, but you know, we don't have long-term data, so we don't really know. Um, I would put in intriguing, uh, uh, alpha ketoglutarate looks pretty interesting to me. Um, again, I think there are questions around bioavailability, which people are most likely to benefit. Uh, but I think, you know, I think that there, there's some potential there. I think some of these autophagy activators, which have gotten more attention recently, look interesting. Um, spermidine would be an example of that. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, but I don't have a, I don't have a ton of confidence in those interventions yet uh, uh, in people. And again, in mice, you know, there isn't a lot that has been tested as much as rapamycin or where the effects are are as big. And one one thing uh, I know that uh, um, you're working with also is to look at combination of uh, longevity compounds. Uh, quite complex area uh, when we start to <laughs> think how different uh, longevity interventions uh, interact with each other. Uh, but uh, you you have a quite uh, interesting approach uh, there of uh, how to accelerate uh, that science. Can you can you tell a little bit? about that. Yeah. So first of all, just to set the stage, right? There, so, so the combinations I think are really interesting and important. Important because almost everybody who's taking one longevity intervention is taking more than one, right? So this is very relevant for the human situation. Very few people are taking one and only one longevity intervention, whether we're talking about supplements or pharmaceuticals or, you know, whatever diet. Um, so, so this is a real world uh, situation where people are combining interventions and we have almost no understanding from the uh, biochemical molecular perspective, what those interactions look like, or from the longevity perspective, even in preclinical an uh, animals or studies, what these interactions look like. Very, very few studies have been done combining more than one intervention uh, in laboratory animals. So the other, the other piece I think that is useful to appreciate here, and this, again, we'll go back to a concept I've hit on a couple of times, which is I believe that we, un, we understand less about the biology of aging than we don't understand. And so I think there's this huge black box out there that nobody's exploring because almost everybody's focused on the hallmarks of aging. How do we explore that black box? And so in my academic lab, we created some technology to really, the goal was really to be able to measure longevity at a scale that is much, much greater than anybody else can do. Um, and so we created some technology called the Wormbot, which is a robotic coupled to AI uh, system for doing high throughput drug discovery longevity uh, analysis in C. elegans. 
The, the goal is to create a platform that allows us to do 100,000 longevity experiments a year. Just to put that in context, you look in drug age, all the drugs ever tested in all of the literature in any organism, it's, a, it's less than 1,500 unique drugs that have ever been tested. So if we can do 100,000 a year, that's, the, that's what we're going for. Okay, so one of the interesting things that we thought we would do just as a proof of principle is a combinatorial experiment. So if you can do 100,000 experiments a year or scale it even higher, you're not limited to doing one drug at a time. You can actually start to explore the combinatorial space of interventions at scale. So as a proof of principle, because we, we don't have any way of predicting right now, how often are you going to get additive, synergistic, canceling, no, no, no effect? We don't know what that looks like. So as a proof of principle, we started with metformin because in C. elegans, we can get a consistent about 15% effect for metformin. And we started combining metformin one by one with other FDA approved drugs. And I'll, I mean, I'll just tell you the in a very general sense, we found interesting interactions. We found cases where actually the drug has no effect. Metformin increases by 15%, but when you combine them, it kills the worms, shortens lifespan. We found cases where we got true additivity. We found a few cases, these are the really interesting ones from a kind of drug development perspective where 15%, 15%, 150% when we combine them. So it looks like true synergy, right? So, so I think the take home is there are really interesting interactions when you start to combine interventions. And, and look, we've only scratched the surface, but I think there are opportunities here to find interventions of effect size that are much bigger than rapamycin, which is the best we've got right now, and also potentially to learn something about the biology of aging that we don't know, right? And the nice thing about FDA approved drugs is, is in many cases, we have some information about the target of those drugs or the pathway that they're targeting. So we can actually, from those interactions, start to maybe develop hypothesis-driven experiments for how they're interacting to hit the biology of aging. So that's the platform. Um, we've spun the company out of my lab. It's called Aura Biomedical. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, to launch this and actually you know, start to create a very large database of longevity interventions some of which will be these interactions that hopefully, and, and I'm confident will, have very large effect sizes that are, you know, double, triple what the best in class is today. And, and I, think, I think that will be interesting. Super interesting uh, step forward, Aaron. At the, that goes a little bit uh, back to the beginning there where you did uh, the first uh, important discovery regarding rapamycin. Now, now it's like you take the next step here and uh, start to look at the combination of uh, uh, interventions. Really, really interesting stuff. And, and let me just you know comment on that real quickly. I mean, I think I think you know we're all influenced by our past experiences, but I think I came into the field you know as a graduate student at a time when we, the hallmarks of aging didn't exist. We didn't really know what the key players were in the biology of aging. And you know the real seminal figures in the field at that time, Cynthia Kenyon, Gary Ruvkin, my PhD advisor, Lenny Garenti, Tom Johnson, and others, the way we learned about the biology of aging and got to where we are today is through those unbiased discovery experiments. And we let the biology tell us what was important. The field has, this is a natural progression, anytime a field matures, has moved much more to a mechanistic kind of approach, right? Where we think we know what the answer is already and we go try to prove it, right? And I think because I came in, into the field in that period of you know rapid discovery, I, I have a bias for, I have a bias for unbiased discovery, right? In other words, I am a believer that um, there's value in not assuming that you understand the system well enough to predict what the important interactions are. And when you can create the opportunity to take an unbiased approach, you will find things that are interesting and important. And I think we've created the opportunity now with the Wormbot to do this in the context of longevity drug discovery in C. elegans. And I'm confident that we will be able to find things that are interesting and important, and I believe will change our understanding of aging biology. So I think I think certainly I was influenced by you know 
that time, that period in the field and seeing what came out of that. And I'm trying to, to at least shift some people in the field to think a little bit less about what we think we already know and more about what we don't know. Yeah, great. Uh, I have uh, some uh, some uh, last uh, rapid uh, questions uh, that uh, we have got from the lis listeners, and uh, it came a lot of questions. So I have tried to group them a little bit, and um, there were very many questions about uh, those uh, protocol. Which those protocol is the best one to take uh, I think we answered that right <laughs> yeah exactly and uh, i don't know i don't know what the answer is this is gonna, this will probably be the answer to all the questions you asked i don't know and uh, uh one one other thing was like uh, do high doses cross the blood the brain barrier it's a good question so so and this gets to you know something i alluded to just in passing which is that i think there's um a lack of clarity even in the literature about how effectively rapamycin crosses the blood brain. So there's two, two things, right? How effectively does rapamycin cross the blood brain barrier and get to the brain? And then secondarily, how effective is rapamycin at inhibiting mTOR complex one activity in the brain? You would expect those things to be completely coupled, but they don't have to be. And what I mean by that is I think from the, at least from the mouse studies, there's absolutely no question that Dosing, rap, dosing mice with rapamycin systemically inhibits mTOR in the brain. There is, I think, some difference of opinion about how effectively the molecule actually gets to the brain. Um, and there is, you know, it's reasonable to speculate if it, if it does um, uh, have problems crossing the blood-brain barrier or if the bioavailability to the brain is lower than other parts of the body, it is certainly reasonable to think that higher doses, uh, at least acute doses, will lead to greater inhibition of mTOR in the brain. I, I would expect that to be true. I don't know of anybody who's actually done you know, a formal study to look at that. It would be surprising if that wasn't the case. But I think the, the implication to that question is, is that a good thing, right? That I don't think we really know. So, you know, again, this is where it's a lot of guesswork, and I certainly understand the rationale for why you might want to do a higher acute dose and a longer washout period. So if we talked just in passing about every other other week rather than weekly, that would be in those people, most of them are doing a higher acute dose and then waiting longer before the next dose. You might expect that that would lead to more rapamycin getting to the brain, more mTOR inhibition at the time of dosing in the brain. I think that's probably true. Is that net beneficial over once weekly dosing? I just don't think we have any data, right? Again, this is where I kind of have to be honest and say, I don't know. And uh, this goes a little bit probably to the next uh, thing also here is that what are the weak points around the uh, rapamycin that we need more research on? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, obviously, I think, you know, Formal clinical trials, double-blind, placebo-controlled in people, you know, looking at defined endpoints, studies that are well-powered. I think this is one of the challenges with the, the few rapamycin clinical trials that have been done aren't very large. And so they're not well-powered enough to really give convincing results. So in the rapamycin world, I would say that's that's probably number one. We talked preclinically about these questions about, especially with immune function, continuous dosing versus... Uh, uh, pre-dosing, right, with rapamycin and whether that affects the outcomes in terms of functional measures of immune. I think all of those kinds of things with, with various rapamycin endpoints are interesting. Uh, the one thing I would point to, this isn't so much a deficiency of rapamycin literature, but of the mTOR inhibitor literature, is we have very little data on other pharmacological mTOR inhibitors, of which there are a few flavors, right? So one are derivatives of rapamycin. Everolimus is the, the probably the most commonly known derivative. Um, there aren't there is very little data in mice on Everolimus in the context of aging. I don't think a lifespan study has ever been published. Joan did some of her studies in elderly humans with Everolimus, um, but we don't. There's very little right comparing Everolimus to rapamycin. It's important. 
the, it's just missing in the literature. There are also uh, AT, what are called ATP competitive inhibitors, a fundamentally different mechanism of mTOR inhibition than rapamycin and everolimus and other rapalogs. So I went into this earlier. Rapamycin is what's called an allosteric inhibitor. It doesn't go to the active site and inhibit mTOR. It binds to another protein and, and breaks apart mTOR complex one or inhibits mTOR complex one. ATP competitive inhibitors look like ATP, which gets in the active site of the mTOR protein. They inhibit both mTOR complex one and mTOR complex two. No data that I know of on longevity with ATP competitive inhibitors. Uh, and then there are, and there are flavors of ATP competitive inhibitors. There are ATP competitive inhibitors that are very specific for TOR. And then there are what are called dual kinase inhibitors that inhibit TOR1, TORC1, TORC2, and other kinases. Uh, no longevity data preclinically that I know of for either of those. Again, getting back to Joan's studies, two of her later trials used uh, a dual kinase inhibitor, which is an ATP competitive inhibitor, uh, in healthy older people. One of them had it in combination with everolimus, one without everolimus, and they got different outcomes in those trials. So I think that is a huge area where there's just been very, very little preclinical work to say, can we tweak mTOR in other ways and maybe do better than rapamycin or do different than rapamycin? Um, and you know that it's a frustration because those experiments really should have been done. They just haven't been done yet. And it's so, uh, it feels a little bit uh, frustrating because uh, the data looks so good. Why don't we put more money and energy onto it so that we move the field forward uh, uh, and get the answers that we need to? So yeah, frustrating. I mean, I think there's lots of reasons. So I, look, first of all, aging research has been generally underfunded for a long, long time. So there's a there's a there has been a scarcity of resources that may be changing, but historically there's been a scarcity of resources, and you know I think there was this perception after the ITP study that you know we knew about rapamycin okay we know about rapamycin even though there's all these really important and interesting questions to be asked the perception was we knew about rapamycin I think there was also a perception that it wasn't a clinically translatable drug because of the reputation that rapamycin had from its organ transplant days. So I think within the field, there was a perception that you could never give this to people for health span or longevity purposes. We obviously know that's true. That's not true. We now know that it's not true, but that was the perception. So I think that led to reviewers. And look, you have to understand the way that things get funded in science. It's the reviewers that determine what gets funded. And I think there was a perception among reviewers we knew about rapamycin. It probably wasn't translatable. So it's not a high priority to fund grants on rapamycin to do this research, right? The last thing I would say is, you know, scientists in this field are like anybody else and they are subject to shiny object syndrome, right? And, you know, there were other shiny objects out there that people could get all excited about. And so a lot of the money went to those other shiny objects and didn't get spent on, on rapamycin research. Let's hope uh, that uh, changes. Uh, some uh, some other quick here. Um, can rapamycin result in uh, any disease or worsen uh, any disease? Do you know that if like uh, diabetes, stroke, or something uh, like yeah. that? So again, I think it depends on context, right? I I I think the data is pretty clear in organ transplant patients, at least in some people. There, there are side effects that uh, lead to uh, impaired glucose homeostasis. So something like diabetes, I think, you know, Misha Blagoslani and others have, have wrote about, is it true diabetes? Is it pseudo diabetes? But certainly what we would call abnormal glucose homeostasis, abnormal lipid profiles are seen in organ plant, transplant patients. Some people taking high doses of rapamycin, you would expect them to be at higher risk, perhaps of cardiovascular disease because of that. Impaired wound healing. So yeah, I mean, the answer is yes. There's no question in that context, organ transplant patients taking rapamycin or other mTOR inhibitors have an increased risk of certain conditions. Uh, I think we don't know in the off-label case, um, it would seem, you know, it seems almost certain that the answer is yes, but it's going to be much reduced from organ transplant patients and it's gonna be very individual dependent, right? So 
I think this is where we really don't have any good understanding. Even the side effects like mouth sores, not everybody gets them, right? And so we don't really understand why that is. We don't understand what that means. So I suspect that the risk of different side effects is much lower in people taking rapamycin off-label. That's almost certain compared to organ transplant patients. And we don't really know like what percentage of people are likely to experience any, any adverse event or increased risk. The kinds of things that you know we would pay attention to, I think, are infection. We talked about that particularly bacterial infection, um, and then maybe some types of cancer. This is, that's the one thing where I think, you know, it's legitimate for people to question whether, how rapamycin impacts cancer risk. And, and part of the problem is cancer isn't one thing, right? There's all sorts of different types of cancer and, you know, cancers can be caused for many different reasons. Um, and so I, it would not surprise me if there, if rapamycin has differential effects on different types of cancer. And it would also not surprise me if rapamycin can maybe increase risk for certain types of cancer, maybe immune cancers. Probably isn't a big effect at low doses, but it could be a small increased risk. You know, the question is, is that offset by a lower risk for a bunch of other types of cancer? I think that's also possible. So, you know, the answer is we don't really, we don't really know, but, but, but nothing comes without risk, right? I mean, I think people have to appreciate that exercise comes with risk. You could, you know, ride your bike and get hit by a bus, right? I mean, you know what I mean? So, so look, there's, there's some risk associated with everything and you have to kind of weigh the data you've got and evaluate risk reward based on the information that you've got. And uh, the last uh, rapid uh, question here is that um, does, uh, we, we touched a little bit on that and um, it was, uh, does rapamycin have any effect on um, appearance, uh, skin health, uh, gray hair or uh, things like that? Uh, do you... I, I, I mean, I don't know. So it's, in, it's an interesting question. So, you know, Chris Sell did a study uh, on skin senescence where they, they uh, used a rapamycin cream and I think people, I think it was opposite hands for the same people, right? So they had a, a control and rapamycin and showed that, you know, they could show reductions in markers of skin senescence and, you know, appearance of the skin with rapamycin topical treatment. So I think, again, the answer is in that context, yes. You know, is it going to be a big effect? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, and, you know, do people taking rapamycin look younger? I, I I don't know. People, you know, <laughs> depends on who you listen to, I think. <laughs> um, I haven't noticed anything, obviously, uh, on myself, uh, but uh, maybe. So I think there is this bigger question, though, around um, should we expect that interventions that target the biology of aging will have an effect on things like gray hair or skin aging or uh, external appearance? Um Maybe, I think is the answer. And it probably depends. I, I don't know that it's necessarily a prediction that an intervention that targets the biology of aging will reverse gray hair or reverse skin aging. It might. We talked about rapamycin. In certain places in the body, in mice, rapamycin seems like it can reverse functional declines. Is that going to translate through to hair color and skin? We don't have any data. So I think it may be asking too much to expect that an intervention is going to reverse uh, cosmetic appearance of aging. The other thing I'll say is the way that humans evaluate appearance, right, is while we're pretty good, I think, at, at evaluating um, health from looking at another person on average, maybe not, not everybody for sure, on average, we have evolved to be able to look at another human being and make some judgment about health, probably because that judgment, you know, was based on the likelihood that that person is a good mate to pass our genes on to the next generation. No question, we have evolved to, to be able to make those judgments. Um, you know, whether that actually is going to be relevant for the biology of aging, I'm not a big believer. I'm not a big believer in that. There's, there, you know, for example, I think most of us agree that not being overweight is on average healthier than being overweight. Yet we all know people who are overweight, obesity, morbid obesity is a different situation. People who are overweight when they're elderly tend to look younger, right? Being Having low body fat tends to make you look older. I don't think we can draw any conclusions from that. So it would be nice to see more 
careful studies of, for example, skin senescence in people taking rapamycin. I haven't seen it. You know, I know that um, I know that Chris was trying to launch a company around the rapamycin effects on skin aging, and I just don't think they've been successful at, at getting funding. I know Alan prescribes rapamycin skin cream to some people. I just haven't seen any data to really be able to evaluate how, how effective um, it is. But I also I also want to just, you know, my own personal view is I think I don't think we can make an assumption a priori that uh, intervention that might target the biology of aging is going to reverse cosmetic appearance of age. And it's a, it's quite complex area. Also, uh, there are so many factors that can play in, uh, which can uh, uh, impact the uh, appearance, stress, the sleep, uh, yeah, a ton of uh, alcohol. Of yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, what. Uh, are your future plans, uh, Matt? Uh... Yeah, so so I uh, just recently left my academic position at the University of Washington. Um, I mentioned we spun out Aura from my lab. I'm not full time at the company, but I'm helping get that get that launched. Um, and then I have taken a position with a startup called Optispan, which is really centered around um, a, a clinical platform, but really trying to create the toolkit that will allow providers who want to practice science-based longevity and preventative medicine to do that at scale. So friction-free science-based longevity and preventative medicine. But, and that's where a lot of what we talked about, the different diagnostics that I've been looking at, my own personal sort of exploration of these diagnostics is tied into that. Part of that is figuring out, you know, what do these different diagnostics tell us? How do we integrate those different data types? How do we start to get to an algorithm that says, okay, based on these diagnostics for this person, you know, here is the hypothesis for a sort of as much as we can right now, a personalized program to move them to a, a better health span trajectory. So it's a really challenging topic, as you can imagine, but um, I think there's a huge opportunity here. You know, I think my view is that, that there are going to be sort of you know, massive changes in the healthcare landscape over the next five to 10 years. I think there have to be, at least in the United States, the current, I would say, disease care paradigm, you know, is um, there's some, some real sustainability problems with that paradigm. In the United States, 90-ish percent of healthcare expenditures goes to treating chronic diseases. Chronic diseases are largely diseases of aging. The reason why that number is going up is because we've been pretty good at keeping sick people alive. But that number is going up, and I don't know when the system's going to break. Maybe it's 92, maybe it's 95, maybe it's 99. But we can't spend 100% of healthcare on chronic disease. So we need an alternative. And I think you know, I think the longevity field is poised to really make some real inroads into healthcare. Uh, you know, I think we have to be honest. At this point, it's early. We need better diagnostics, but I want to play a role in, in helping that transition happen. So that's that's what I'm up to. And um, you know, I'm pretty excited to see where it goes. Yeah, that sounds uh, great. Where where can people uh, find you online? Well, I'm on Twitter sometimes, although I've been taking a break from Twitter, at MK Everline. Um, I'm easy to find online. Put my name into Google and you'll probably get more information than you ever wanted. Um, we don't have much up yet about Optispan, but I would say stay tuned. We're uh, we're still kind of in stealth mode, but we'll be we'll be putting some content out there for people to digest. Hopefully, in the next uh, couple of months. Yeah, it has been uh, great to talk to you, Matt, and uh, I wish you really good luck with uh, everything uh, now in your next uh, journey here. So. That's right, my new career, which is. <laughs> my old career but yeah it's gonna be fun all right thanks a lot yeah no it's been it's been a, it's been a blast yeah take care all right have a good day disclaimer the podcast is for general information and uh, educational purposes only and it's not medical advice for you or others the use of information and other things linked to the podcast is at the user's own risk Always consult your physician with anything you do regarding your health or medical conditions.